Excellencies, distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We are delighted to welcome you to the second international conference on art for technology, science and humanities, ARTES 2020. Organized by the Visual Art Study, Faculty of Arts and Design, Bandung Institute of Technology. This year, our test brings the topic of transdiscipline approach, challenge of art in practice and education in virtual space discourse, reflection, interaction, and projection. This conference provides a great opportunity for art educators, artists, designers, curators, researchers, scientists, students, and professionals to collaborate discuss and share their useful experimental ideas and experiences in the scope of art education in the third decade of the 21st century. Excellencies, distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce and welcome all distinguished guests, the chair of the committee, Art Test 2020, Dr. Nuning Yanti Damayanti, the Head of Visual Arts Study Program, Faculty of Arts and Design, Bandung Institute of Technology, Dr. Dik Dik Sayadikumullah, Dean of Faculty of Arts and Design, Bandung Institute of Technology, Dr. Rik Rik Andrianto Rik Rik Kusmara, Rector of Bandung Institute of Technology, Professor Reini Wirahadi Kusuma, General Director of Culture, Ministry of Education and Culture, Republic of Indonesia, Mr. Hilmar Farid, PhD. Our honorable speakers, Dr. Catherine Coleman, Dr. Steve Adisa Smito Smith, Dr. Ono Widodo Purbo, Professor Gunnar Spellmeyer, Mr. Aaron Sido, PhD, Dr. Sparisoma Firidi. Our honorable guest, Mr. Imam Buhari, Mr. Setiawan Sabana, Ms. Penny Chandrarini, Mr. Ade Pirus, and Mrs. Yani Panigoro, and all presenters and participants of the second International Conference on Art for Technology, Science, and Humanities. Thank you. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to continue our agenda with a photo session. To the keynote speakers, the head of the program, the dean, director, the representative of the committee, as well as the participant, you are all invited to open your camera and take a position. Excellencies, participants, 
Ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to start the opening ceremony by first listening to the committee report presented by Dr. Nuning Yanti Damayanti, the chair of the committee of the Second International Conference on Art for Technology, Science and Humanities, Artes 2020. For Dr. Nuning Yanti Damayanti, the floor is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. All prizes is due to Allah, the hope for enabling us to meet together in the Second International Conference Artes 2020. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The Honorable Rector Institute of Technology Bandung, Ibu Professor Reni Wirahadikusuma, PhD, General Director of the Ministry of Education and Culture, Bapak Hilma Farid, PhD, our Dean Dr. Adianto Rikrikusmara, uh, Chairman of Visual Arts Study Program, Dr. Didik Sayah Dikumulo, all of Chairman in the Faculty of Art and Design, and all of lecture, and also our beloved students, especially our honorable invited speaker who are willing to fulfill our invitation. Parallel speakers and all participants, and also all of organizing committee members, Artes 2020. First of all, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to extend my warmest greeting and enthusiastically welcome you all to the second Artes 2020. This year, we try to bring up the theme of challenges and opportunity of art in practice and education in virtual uh, space discourse also about reflection, interaction, and projection. Welcome to the Virtual International Conference, and I hope that for all participants to enjoy. We believe that the aforementioned aspect play an important role in creating an integrated art for the new high communication technology and unlimited information also in internet and virtual world era. Also, me to deliver, to deliver several points of report as follows. The second international conference, Artes 2020, is effort to accommodate exchange of theories, information, and research, uh, research results among experts of the ever-challenging topic of art for technology, science, and humanities. In focusing about reflection, interaction and projection, also the challenge and opportunity of art in practice and education in virtual space discourse. The main event is divided into, uh, into two sessions, plenary session and parallel session. This year, we invited international speakers such as the Honorable Professor Gunnar, uh, Gunnar Hellmeyer from University of Applied Sciences and Art, Hanover, Germany. Associate Professor Dr. Steve Adisa Smith Smith from State University of Fresno, California, USA. Dr. Katrin Coleman from Melbourne University, Australia. Dr. Arun Suta from Australia, the Chairman of Contemporary Museum Gallery Machan in Jakarta. Dr. Ono Purbo from Dharmajaya University in Indonesia. And uh, the last Dr. Renat Parisoma Firidi from ITB, Indonesia. The speakers are also whom we believe shall bring new insight into the development of synergy of art and science as well as art, technology, humanities in education. For parallelization, there are 97 accepted abstract, but only nine, 93 papers to be presented during the conference. Some of them are from ITB, while others come from various institutions across Indonesia. There are also several overseas participants from Malaysia and Australia. Therefore, I hope that this conference is beneficial to all. Representing to uh, the organizing committee of the conference, I would like to express my profound gratitude and participation at this seminar uh, to all the supporters. ITB, LPPM ITB, and Faculty of Art and Design. Furthermore, I would like to thank the paper presenter for their participation. Also, we tied, uh, also we tied 
whom the seminar will be meaningless. I hope we will get useful and good experience even though it is still in atmosphere of COVID-19, which causes this conference to be held uh, online. We would also like to extend my deepest gratitude to the organizing committee and to everyone who has worked hard to support and take part in organizing this conference. Finally, I do hope that the second international conference on art uh, for technology, science and humanities 2020 will be a memorable one to attend. I wish everyone enjoy this valuable event. Thank you very much for the attention. Wabil Taufik, wal hidayah, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Nuning Yanti Damayanti. Excellencies, distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Now we are going to have the welcoming speech from the head of Visual Art Study Program, Faculty of Art and Design, Bandung Institute of Technology, Dr. Dik Dik Sayadikumula. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Dik Dik Sayadikumula. Hello and welcome to Artes 2020 Second International Conference on Art for Technology, Science and Humanities. I am Dik Dik Sayadikumulo, Chair of Program Study in Visual Art, Faculty of Arts and Design, ITB. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to Artes 2020 second in first fully online conference. It's a new experience for us to be talking to a global audience directly in these pandemic times. Good morning, Your Excellency, Mr. Hilmar Farid, PhD, Director General of Culture, Ministry of Education and Culture, Republic Indonesia. Your Excellency, Professor Reini Virahadikusuma, Rector of Bandung Institute of Technology, Your Excellency Dr. Andrianto Rikrikusmara, Dean of Faculty of Arts and Design, Bandung Institute of Technology, the Honorable Our Speakers, Professor Dr. Gunnar Helmeyer, Dr. Orno Widodo Purbo, Dr. Steve Adisa Smito Smith, and Dr. Catherine Coleman and Dr. Aaron Seto. In this conference, we want to start to be a biennial events that have previously held since 2018, initiated by our research group in Faculty of Arts and Design, ITB. Because we think, consider, and realize that cultural human realities are currently following the tremendous flow of global change in every field, even if very effort to respond or to challenge all of which, it will discover various beliefs, perspectives, and values, especially in the last decades, connection with the development of digital computer and internet technology to the limitless virtual world. At an increasingly fast feed affecting in the arts and humanities. Discussing arts within the cultural framework of education system and art practice seem all to all endless or in persistent situation where all of them are perceived as life energies that reflects a variety of activities, interaction, interrelation, and perspective of thought without boundaries, disciplines, expertise, dichotomy of theories and practice which offer to reveal with on the impact of information technology on awareness of art education and making of contemporary art as practice. We believe that effort to discuss it all through the focus of this seminar's topic about challenge of art in practice and education in virtual space discourse, reflection, interaction, and projection is more than just enriching knowledge, experience new social gathering, 
also invite us to celebrate collaborative synergy among all disciplines of art, science, technology, and humanities. Before we do so, I want to thank various key organizations who made this week possible. Thanks to the organizing committee for reimagining this conference virtually in such an innovative and exciting way, which I know you all going to enjoy. We are grateful to the people of Indonesia for the support of our sponsors, acknowledged to all participants, also moderators, for making us so welcome and sharing some of their ideas, perspectives, and experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dick Dick Sayadikumullah for the welcoming speech. Excellencies, distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Now we're going to have a welcoming speech from the Dean of Faculty of Art and Design, Bandung Institute of Technology, Dr. Adrian Torik Rikusmara, PhD. Dr. Adrian Torik Rikusmara, the time is yours. Good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Representing Faculty of Art and Design, we feel honored hosting the second international conference, Artes, the challenge of art in practice and education in virtual space discourse, organized by the Art Study Program, Faculty of Art and Design, ITB. I would like to express my best wishes and sincere gratitude to the Honorable our Rector Institute Technology Bandung, Professor Reni Wirahadikusuma, PhD, and the Honorable Dr. Hilmar Farid, Director General of Culture, Ministry of Education and Culture, Indonesia. And to the all invited keynote speakers for accepting our invitations to share experience and expertise. This international conference will discuss the meaning and the role of art from various aspects, such as art contributions in higher education in the context of the digital communication technology and digital culture. We all realize that the art world has witnessed a number of development and movement that have occurred dynamically in the last decades related to the development of internet technology extending to the virtual world without border and digital computer techniques at an accelerating rate that affect aspect of human life and creativity in various branches of science especially in the arts and humanities this virtual cross-web interaction and communication takes out some place of real human life. In this case, art activities can virtually make people connect and interact. Even there is no distance, there is no difference in race and nations, connecting between countries, nations, and continents. The higher education in arts cannot distance their self toward the impact of advanced globalization with social relations and interdependence between humans and regions are getting bigger. The development of information technology, which is starting to replace the role of human and the very large dependence toward the fast changing database recently the exploration of concept and expressions in contemporary visual culture has enriched the quality of scope of art world and has impact on the various social field of art and also technology and humanities. Within this context, the Faculty of Art and Design ITB honored to be able to contribute in discussing the latest contemporary problems through this international conference, especially in the development of the art education paradigm concept 
including art, craft, and design. And once again, congratulations and appreciation are conveyed to various parties and partners for their role in supporting this program. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Adrian Torik Rikusmara. We are now continuing to the next agenda. That is to listen to the welcoming speech from the Rector of Bandung Institute of Technology, Professor Reini Wirahadi Kusuma, PhD. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Reini Wirahadi Kusuma, PhD. Warmest greeting from Bandung. Uh, good morning. Uh, it is uh, always my pleasure to welcome you to ITB uh, this morning to the second Artesh International Conference 2020, Arts for Technology, Science, and Humanities, uh, organized by my friends, my colleague, uh, the Visual Art Study Program, uh, Faculty of Visual Art and Design, Institute of Technology Bandung. Uh, I would like uh, to take this opportunity to express my best wishes and sincere gratitude to the Director General of Culture, Ministry of Education and Culture, Bapak Dr. Hilman, Hilmar Farid. Salam kenal Pak, the Dean, Pak Rikrik Kusmara and his wonderful staff, to all keynote speakers, for accepting our invitation to share their experiences and exp expertise. Uh, I also would like to say hello to Pak Setiawan Sabana, Pak Pagi Pak, Pak Imam Bukhari, Pak Pirus, dan Bapak Ibu uh, senior lainnya. Uh, semoga sehat-sehat selalu. Uh, we all realize that the art world has witnessed a number of developments and movements that have occurred dynamically uh, in the last decades uh, related to the development of internet technology, extending to the virtual world without borders and digital computer techniques at an accelerating rate uh, that affects uh, aspects of human life and creativity in various branches of science. Uh, especially, uh, this is uh, very beneficial for the arts and humanity sector. And uh, recently triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, uh, it has become an opportunity for art people to face this uh, unfortunate condition. So it's unfortunate, but it is an opportunity. The main trend that develops in the art practice today is the rise of new forces that enrich art in an international context due to global, global cultural interactions. Uh, these changes, the frame of mind of us, of men, in his vision to reflect on the origin of the tradition of creating cultural products that lead to diversity and artistic reinvention today. Uh, also, transdisciplinary research-based art practice has spread to all corners of the earth and gave birth to new materials and non-material media. Its growth is supported by the rise of information and digital technology that creates a world without borders. The creative side of art creation has pushed the boundaries of science and increased its use to bridge innovation and scientific or technology societies. In the social sciences and humanities, art serves as an imaginative playground in which abstract concepts can be safely explored. Art higher education, such as ITB, takes a central part in this movement. The transdisciplinary approach and research-based art creation are not new 
to the learning tradition at ITB. Through this conference, a critical and timely idea was put forward. How can art in the virtual world technology age further synergize with technology, science, and the humanities? That is the question. Participants will be able to hear and discuss how relevant the synergy of higher education between arts, science, technology, and humanities can be achieved to not only create a better future for all of us, but also a future led by a generation that is responsive and at the same time empathetic. So we believe that the, those aspects uh, play an important role in realizing integrated art in the new era, in the era of virtual unlimited communication and information technology. So on this special occasion, I would like to congratulate the organizers, Bu Nuning Damayanti and his great team for their hard work, uh, for their success in organizing this extraordinary event. And I thank all the participants, of course, who have contributed to our uh, future progress. And finally, I wish you all a joyful, inspiring discussions and also networking. Thank you very much. I hope to see all of you again in a very much better circumstances, face to face. ITB are looking forward to our wonderful future collaboration. Please stay healthy, stay happy. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Reni, for the warm welcoming speech. So we would like to ask uh, Professor Reni Wirahadi Kusuma to officially open the second international conference on art for technology, humanities, and science, Art Test 2020, after the welcoming speech from Mr. Hilmar Farid, PhD. Excellency, distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to have welcoming speech from General Director of Culture, Ministry of Education and Culture, Republic of Indonesia, Mr. Hilmar Farid, PhD. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Hilmar Farid, PhD. First of all, welcome to all the participants. Um, it is a really an honor um, to address this uh, conference and I really hope that uh, our discussions um, will help us to uh, navigate our way um, for the uh, future. So, uh, as we know, the, the impact of uh, the pandemic on um, on art on the art world has been unprecedented. You know, artists, um, art organizations uh, today still grappling with the changes. Um, uh, my office is now um, uh, facing challenges like budget cuts, postponements cancellation of programs, and also interestingly, a forced migration to the digital realm, like us today. I mean, uh, if it has been normal, then we would uh, have an in-person meeting instead of like communicating uh, through this uh, media. But um, yeah, and again, galleries, museums, cultural institutions are bleeding with no foreseeable recovery. So nobody knows what is going to happen. Um, next year, for example, and many of these institutions have been forced to cease operation while others have been shut down permanently. And I'm not talking about like small galleries in some countries, I'm talking really about like established uh, cultural institutions in um, industrial countries uh, like the UK, uh, Europe, uh, in the United States, and all of these institutions are now uh, having um, difficulties uh, in coping with the impact of the pandemic. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that the artwork is undergoing significant changes and the future is still unpredictable. Yeah? But one thing is clear, like uh, before, before the pandemic or like say a decade ago, uh, we would talk about the role of digital technology and art education um, out of perhaps curiosity. 
yeah, what is interesting. We are experimenting, um, share ideas, but now we are discussing this out of necessity. Yeah. Um, so, um, but 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 again, however disruptive the pandemic has been and will be to our lives, it is of course not the only reason why we begin uh, to look closer into new possibilities of using digital technology for our purposes. Yeah. Uh, the media landscape, for example, has changed rapidly in the last two decades and has affected the art world significantly in terms of production, distribution, exhibition, and also consumption. Um, if you look at the value chain of the arts, um, um, so far, it has been dominated by established institutions that I just mentioned before, galleries, museums, auction houses, art schools, journals, critics, but now it has become increasingly diverse. I mean, you have new actors, new institutions, new ways of doing things. And of course, digital art, uh, online distribution have contributed to this, to this process. And one of the impacts of this is that the art scene itself has become more representative. I mean, in terms of class, gender, uh, race, ethnicity, and so on. And digital platforms like Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, and all that have become important outlets also for younger artists. So um, there is a demogra demographic shift, say, so to say, uh, in the art world today. And in many ways, art has become more experiential, yeah, collective uh, rather than individual. Um, boundaries, uh, disciplines are now collapsing. Um, more and more discussions about interdisciplinary uh, uh, approaches. And uh, basically it generates uh, talks about a more fluid nature and future of arts. Yeah. So before it was like, more in, in, in rather established uh, categories, but now we are uh, thinking about a, a more fluid nature of art. And um, in this occasion, I will briefly discuss a few initiatives that I think are very interesting and more or less um, reflect the state of the art of the discussions that we are having now. Uh, the first initiative is a very interesting one. It is called the Next Rembrandt Project. It was initiated a few years ago. Uh, in a minute, I will show you um, um, the website of, of that project. Um, the project basically uses data of 346 paintings of the famous Dutch artist Rembrandt. Um, what it does, it, it, it extracted a different features of the painting, such as composition, color, and also the ge geographical pattern, including a height map um, to understand the texture of the painting. Yeah. So all these uh, features were done processed using artificial intelligence and machine learning, and, and then uh, generate Rembrandt's original features, yeah, perhaps not known to Rembrandt himself, which is very interesting for art historians, um, to create an entirely new, a typical Rembrandt quote unquote painting. And experts who have been part of the project said or claimed that they would mistaken this painting for Rembrandt's if they had found it in a collection somewhere. Yeah. And this is a very interesting project. I think I should, uh, should show it to you uh, right now. So this is, this is uh, the project. Um, if you don't mind, I will uh, briefly play the video. It's a very short video. So we can uh, get uh, what this project is about. Can you hear the sound of the video? No sound. Unfortunately not. No sound yet, sir. Can you hear the sound? No. No, sir. No sound, yes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I just fast forward it uh, to, 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 and explain what it, what, what's happening here. So, Basically, they're gathering the data um, by studying the works of, of, of Rembrandt. And so all of the uh, works that are in the collection of the museums are scanned using 3D scanners. No. And 
And then they picked like one of the figures here uh, to become the subject of the new painting, mm. like facial recognition and all that. So these are the features um, of the subject. So the process everything, generating the features. So all these like typical eyes, nose of Rembrandt. And using algorithms, then they calculated everything. So all aspects of the painting, all dimensions are calculated. This is very interesting, the height map of which Rembrandt himself is probably, was probably never aware. So instead of trying to imitate the brush strokes, um, they are uh, calculating the impact of the brush stroke onto the um, surface. So this is the new painting. Yeah. So um, this is the first example um, that I uh, want to share with you at this moment. Second. Um, the second initiative, uh, which I also found uh, interesting, um, is a, um, a, a website that basically hosts artists who explore the impact of artificial, artificial intelligence uh, on art and society. Um, these are artists who explore questions and ideas like whether a, uh, artificial intelligence can expand human creativity and how to train machines to create new images based on algorithms um, that connects images from photo sharing website, for example, with essential concepts on human life, um, such as love, art, faith, the universe, um, and so on. So uh, this is also a very interesting um, um, initiative. And again, I want to show you the uh, website of it. Um, it's here. Yeah. So it's aiartists.org. Uh, um, and these are the artists involved in this project. Many of them are, are, are tech savvy for sure. I mean, they know how to code and um, use algorithms and all that. Um, but um, what is interesting from the, these um, set of, of uh, projects or initiatives are exactly what we are discussing today. Like what are the boundaries between art technology? Uh, when does art stop, for example? You know, and when, when do we, like for, for example, with the Rembrandt uh, project that I, I explained before, we can easily, for example, um, uh, pick an artist here uh, from Bandung, from ITB, um, people like, um, yeah. And then combine the data that is gathered from the artwork with the personal data, yeah. Um, health reports. Um, browsing history and all that, like combine all that, and then you will have a more um, closer prediction of what the artist will actually produce than the um, um, speculation about uh, the future Rembrandt that, uh, that I just showed. So, and this is not impossible. We are actually now uh, interestingly moving into that direction, yeah, like bringing together um, data uh, from different uh, aspects of our lives into one, yeah. And, and I'm sure you are all familiar with the recent developments in journalism, uh, for example, where now um, news items and even opinions are actually written by machines, not by journalists anymore. And um, established uh, news um, 
institutions like the Guardian, etc., uh, abroad um, have started using that uh, for several years already. You know, so uh, this is not impossible, but uh, we are moving into that direction. So the last initiative that I want to show you is actually homemade here from Yogyakarta in Indonesia. It is um, called um, the uh, wait a second. I have to. Apologies, I think I have lost it. Okay, let's see. It's the um, home of a, a nature fiber yeah, in Yogyakarta. This is a very interesting initiative um, where uh, artists are combining uh, arts and technology, their interest in space, etc., cetera, um, to find solutions to our daily problems. Yeah, combining our technology um, with their concern about uh, humanity and diff or, uh, different issues. So this is the website of, of, the pro of the organization. It's Foundation for Art, Science and Technology uh, called HONF. Um, and uh, for example, one of their uh, interesting uh, projects um, is about um, the pandemic um, where they, basically uh, we're initiating ways using technology of helping um, medical institutions to, to get their medical supplies. It also helps the population to find um, safe passages through which they can uh, actually uh, go to distribute uh, essential uh, needs of, um, in the society and so on. So it is um, again, a very interesting uh, project which brings together uh, our technology um, and uh, also social purposes. Um, so um, all these like different initiatives um, has brought me to an, a very fundamental question um, about the role of the artist. I mean, for, for decades, um, we have been discussing, the art world has been discussing uh, the idea of the death of the artist. Yeah, since the development of technology has changed, um, the say the supremacy of the artist uh, in the art scene. And, but uh, I think what is happening right now is that technology will probably replace um, human labor in several parts of the process in artistic production. But at the same time, it will actually expand creativity to new levels. Yeah. This is like photography. Yeah. Photography in the 19th century, in the 20th century, early 20th century, basically liberated art from depicting, um, of describing the world on canvas. Yeah. It allows at the same time, <clears throat> artists to focus more on concepts, abstraction. And I think so today, technology will liberate human imagination from the current constraints. Yeah. And I think, <clears throat> In order to do that, in order to, to bring about these changes, uh, we need to confront basic fundamental questions in art, in the field of aesthetics, art and society. Yeah, and there are very important uh, studies on collective consciousness, um, common in cinema, OTT and all that, and including also the function and meaning of art. And what are the implications of all this for art education? Yeah, and I think um, what we have seen um, so far through these like a few examples, there are many more, is that um, software algorithms, um, et cetera, have shaped the world around us. And artists, of course, need to have a strong grasp of the practical and philosophical implications of this transformation. It doesn't mean, of course, that everybody has to learn how to code, you know? uh, It is good if you can, but um, at least we should get acquainted with basic ideas of media, computing, and so on, in order to navigate our way in this like emerging field of uh, where you can really see our technology actually blends together into something new that has no name yet. Yeah, and um, uh, for centuries, yeah, this is also a very significant change. Um, for centuries, art has been based on the idea of scarcity. Yeah, scarcity equals value. Why is a certain uh, painting uh, 
uh, important and uh, also expensive because it's scarce. Yeah, because you don't, you cannot get it just simply on the market. Yeah, but if today digital art, for example, yeah, uh, can be easily reproduced, <clears throat> then they are probably worthless, right? Because it's not scarce anymore. I mean, you can get it easily anywhere. You can download it. It's like what have, what is happening to music today. Yeah, you can download like music and you don't bother to buy yeah, because it's free, it's, it's accessible. You can get it easily, no? So today there have been initiatives to create limited editions yeah, um, of paintings, of, of artwork in general, yeah, authenticated by blockchain technology. So you, you know that this is only uh, meant to be distributed to a particular audience, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, all these developments, I think, will further push and raise the questions of access, value, and so on in the art world. Yeah? And um, I will end this uh, talk with a very broad, broad uh, question, and is uh, actually uh, meant to be uh, shared with you, participants of the conference, with the hope that you would come up with fresh ideas uh, to, to, to intervene in the, in the debate, and um, of course, uh, to develop our conversation further. So um, in the future, I think art may not look like art as we know it. Yeah? We are in fact today surrounded by art. Yeah? Be before when you have to go, you had to go to a gallery, to a museum, to uh, enjoy art, to have access to that. But now you are surrounded by that. Yeah? You are basically in a uh, condition of, of being overwhelmed by art. No? So the question then is, does this mean that we are actually going back to the beginning of the cycle of humanity, where practices of, of, of art or what we consider today as being art are actually embedded in everyday life? I mean, that's what happened in the beginning of humanity. Art was not like a special field or a special branch of knowledge. No, it was basically part of daily life. Yeah. So the question is, are we going back to that, uh, to the beginning of the cycle? And if that's the case, then we really should expand our discussion about art education, uh, not simply about art in higher education, in, in schools of art and all that, but also to include the teaching of creativity in general education. So that's what art education in the digital uh, age actually means, to induce critical, critical and creative thinking in general education. So uh, it is not about art itself, uh, but it is about enhancing the capacity and skills um, for the general population in the future, including to anticipate unknown jobs. I mean, jobs are now diminishing. I mean, in, in, in 20, uh, probably in 10 years, um, many jobs that uh, will disappear and replaced by new ones, which we don't know yet. Yeah. So creative and critical thinking through art education is really essential. I mean, we certainly cannot predict the future, but we should be prepared for many futures. The future will be multiple and plural. It is not a future, but many futures. So this is what I have to share with you for this conference. I wish you a very good conversation in the conference. Thank you very much. It's wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikum salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Mr. Hilma, for the wonderful presentation. So actually your enthusiasm, your energy is very contagious. So uh, I believe that all the participants get many insights from you with talking about many initiative to combine art and technology. So once again, thank you very much, Mr. Hilmer. So ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, so I would like to invite Professor Reini Wiradi Kusuma to officially open the second international conference on art for technology, science and humanities, Art Test 2020. For Professor Reini Wiradi Kusuma, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, I myself and all of the participants uh, actually enjoy uh, listening to your presentation, Pahilmar. I wish we all could physically be in that 
Rembrandt uh, Museum <laughs> in Amsterdam, I believe, ya. Yeah. Di mana yes, itu? Very, very interesting. I myself a civil engineer, but uh, as I'm aging, I can uh, appreciate the art uh, very much, you know. So it is very, you know, uh, fulfilling uh, to uh, understand yeah. art and uh, the beauty and the creative creativity of humankind. Uh, okay, so Bapak Ibu sekalian, uh, please. Uh, let us all uh, start this wonderful uh, conference and let's start uh, strengthening our network, our friendship and have a, a productive uh, day. Uh, thank you, Pak Hilmar dan Bapak Ibu sekalian. Uh, bersama ini kami buka acara uh, Artes 2020. Uh, terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, all the guests, honorable guests. Thank you very much, Mr. Hilmar Farid, for the insight. We are very grateful for the time and effort uh, you took to share and uh, to share your thoughts and experience about art and technology. Okay, so thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, now we come to the end of the, our opening ceremony. Performance from ITV Student Choir. Here is ITV Student Choir. Enjoy. Excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our main agenda, the first plenary session. Let me inform you the agenda for the first plenary session. This morning, we are indeed honored and privileged to have with us three great speakers who will share with us their view and experiences on art for technology, science, and humanities. There will be two speakers in this plenary session. First, Dr. Catherine Coleman from University of Melbourne, Australia. Second, Dr. Steve Adisasmito Smith from University of Renzo, California, USA. Third, Dr. Ono Widodo Purbo from Informatic and Business Institute, Dharma Jaya, Indonesia. During this first plenary session, all the speakers will be moderated by Mr. Hafiz Aziz Ahmad, PhD. Let me give you a brief introduction of our moderator. Mr. Hafiz Aziz Ahmad, PhD, is now a lecturer in Faculty of Arts and Design, Bandung Institute of Technology. He is also part of Visual Communication and Multimedia Research Group. He finished his undergraduate study in Bandung Institute of Technology, and he got his master degree in School of Computer Design, Usung University, South Korea. Then he pursued his doctoral of philosophy in Chiba University, Japan. 
Without further ado, I now invite Mr. Hafiz Aziz Ahmad, PhD, to moderate the first plenary session. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Hafiz Aziz Ahmad, PhD. Uh, thank you for uh, the MC for the introduction. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody, and good morning also for distinguished guests and also distinguished uh, speakers for today's uh, conference. So the Art Test 2020 theme is about challenges of art in practice and education in virtual space discourse, reflection, interaction, and projection. Therefore, since we, ha we have uh, speakers from different backgrounds and different uh, nations, uh, we are hopeful that uh, for this conference, we will have a broader and deeper insights uh, related to the current condition due to the pandemic uh, uh, and in terms of how art could be beneficial in ut uh, utilizing uh, virtual space. <clears throat> and as uh, being introduced by uh, the MC, yeah, for the first session, we will have three distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, Dr. Catherine Coleman from University of Melbourne, Australia. Dr. Steve Adisa Smith-Smith from State University of Fresno, California, USA. And uh, Dr. Orno Widodo Purbo from Informatic and Business Institute, Dharma Jaya, Indonesia. And since we will have uh, interesting uh, topics and discussion, therefore, uh, we would like to invite the audience and guests. If you have questions and comments for the presentation of the speakers, please feel free to write down your questions or your comments uh, in the chat uh, section. And we will discuss the questions after the presentation of all uh, speakers. So uh, I think we will begin with the first speaker for the uh, for this uh, plenary session. So we welcome you to have a presentation from Dr. Catherine Coleman. Thank you. Hi, thanks for having me here today. My name is Kate Coleman and I'm a senior lecturer at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education at the University of Melbourne in NAM, Australia. I'm going to talk today about post-digital art practices. A slash R slash T indicating the artist, researcher and teacher and hope, creativity and speculation found in a pandemic. I'm going to talk about two particular case studies, one that I've worked on um, with Science Gallery Melbourne and the other in my own radical collaboration with becoming teachers as activist practitioners and what that means coming out of a pandemic and how we might shift an understanding of what art education is in the wider art ecology. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation where I live and work, who have been custodians of this land for thousands and thousands of years. I wish to acknowledge and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging and further acknowledge First Nations people as our first artists and the significant role that First Nation people cultures and places play in global art education communities. I'm going to begin by positioning myself within the larger pandemic data. This is a piece of data from the Australian Government Department of Health and it indicates how Victoria in relation to the rest of states and territories in Australia came through the pandemic. Here I find myself um, at the end of the reopening uh, of a roadmap that our Premier Daniel Andrews announced back in March. And we made it to the last step of that roadmap on November 23. We have been under stay at home directions for 168 days and for restrictions for 235 days. And it's why I'm able to talk about the kinds of impacts of a pandemic on art education and talk about the use of digital methods and tools because of the way that we have been in our homes here in Melbourne. Um, most of my students, as well as me, we have been at home since March. Um, we have participated and um, learnt and taught and researched and lived through digital means now for some time, with Melbourne having only just opened up now that we can head out into freedom. And I walked this morning without a face mask on. You can look at the data um, of Victoria. It's the last piece um, on the right hand side of the Australian um, mainland. And Victoria has numbers there of 20,345 corona cases, 
um, with 819 sad and tragic deaths. If you look at the numbers around the rest of the country, you can, you can see why Melbourne had one of the hardest and longest lockdowns in the country. Um, and for much of Melbourne, we've actually undergone one of the strictest um, stay at home directions and restrictions that we've seen across most of the world. Um, we are now though at 23 days of no cases and no active cases in our community. The next piece of context I want to give you is a methodological one. As a digital researcher and artographer, I work in the nexus between the post-digital um, and the post-human in a speculative research inquiry. Post-digital research enables me to, to work with a, the human experience, but also to focus on the more than human and the non-human. Um, it enables and allows me opportunities to think about what digital methods enable in creative research, and particularly what digital methods and tools enable for digital pedagogies in art education. The post-digital is concerned with this rapidly changing and changing relationships with digital technologies and art forms. And the post-digital artist is really working in that um, space between art, culture, society and technology and seeing the kinds of boundaries that they can cross um, and move around in different spaces and sites. I'm very lucky to work on a range of um, creative data projects using digital methods at the University of Melbourne. One of those here in the link to this um, curated Omega site called Data Creativities, which with the Melbourne Data Analytics Platform has, has been focused on social and cultural research during COVID and what has happened in the creative industries um, in Melbourne and in Australia, where really those um, harsh lockdowns have impacted on how artists exhibit their work, how artists continue to work in studios, and what a post-studio, post-digital practice might offer. I'm working in the post-digital space, which if we use this um, post-digital marketing kind of language, is a one-to-moment, where the human there in the centre um, has opportunities and openings in multiple digital environments. Multiple digital feedback loops are enabled from social media sites to um, their production and, and um, consumption of art world and, and, and media. It means that if that's the artist in there, they're actually able to engage in a wider gallery, library and museum sector experience and for their work to live online and to be active and relational in, in the online environment. Most of where I work is in the digital space um, as a secondary art educator lecturer. Um, we are working in a one-to-one -one space as much as possible, even though there's a collective post-digital, which I truly believe in, a lot of the kind of transmission environment through COVID has been very digital. Um, and then we have this other context where I, I see most of our art education in schools in the pre-digital space, the one to many, where art education might be visiting um, through Google Art and Culture, uh, a gallery um, on the other side of the world. And this one person is engaging with the, the multitude and multiplicities of the glam sector but not really getting anything back. You know, it's not a one-to-one -one where I'm actually receiving information back or being alerted to things. I'm in control of the experience, but it's not a relational um, or affective environment such as the post-digital, which, which really is a responsive um, digital environment where the connection and the collaboration and the collective um, is visible. So right at the start of the pandemic in March, this is where I've been since here I am today sitting in front of this. Um, I'm in my study, teaching, researching, um, learning, collaborating, working with my colleagues to develop new ways of understanding in art education as well as in the digital humanities. Throughout this pandemic, I wanted to draw on a couple of things before I get to my two particular projects. The post-digital environment has been an innovative um, 
change, a paradigm, shi a paradigm shift for art education in Australia, where the glam sector itself became the relational responsive space, rather than that experience, um, digital experience of getting online and, and walking through a gallery space in Google Art and Culture, and maybe creating my own little gallery collection like I can in, in that space. The hashtag space, which has really, for me, changed the, the culture for art education, has meant that I'm participating. I'm an active participant in the glam sector, where my work is being exhibited in a wider art collective using, these, um, using the feedback loop of the hashtag. Heidi at Home meant that young people uh, in their home, seven years old, could have their portrait up on the Heidi website. Now, Heidi is the Museum of Modern Art here in Melbourne. It's, it's an important part of Melbourne heritage and culture. And that, that is a significant piece of post-digital work. Uh, we saw the Getty Museum Challenge as a global um, piece of art education. So not just um, in the classroom, but the broader context of people at home dressing up uh, and performing and role-playing artworks. That's an art education that I'm really excited about and where those slashes between A, R and T become more important in a speculative artographic way where we're doing art and research and teaching. There's a pedagogical implication for these hashtags. They actually draw us closer as INSEA presented as their hashtag early in the pandemic. Some other work I've been able to do with Dr. Abby McDonald at the University of Tasmania is think about the implications for professional learning as artographers. How can artists, researchers and teachers come together to develop new ways of learning and being and doing post pandemic? Now that we've moved ourselves from the pre into the digital environment as educators. And the way to do that was to shift the physical space from the studio to the post studio. Here's an example um, Abby and I wrote about in Teacher Magazine, where teachers began getting those um, modalities home. Art at home bags here set up by Michelle Coombs, a New South Wales visual art teacher, to ensure that there was an equity at home. Those art materials could begin to shift in a post studio space and we could think about medium differently through an understanding of materiality, but we had to start somewhere. We had to enable the establishment or setup of the infrastructure of a studio at home, in the kitchen, the lounge room, the bedroom, the bathroom, as some of my students have even worked or out on balconies. But to move that shift into the, into the post-digital, we needed um, the post-studio environment to come with it. And how did we do that? We needed to send materials home. To do that, Art Education Australia that I'm a council member for also established a digital space as a collaborative, a collective space where art educators across the country could share the kinds of digital materials that they were working with from the glam sector. So that instead of people having to do that scouring and curating and sourcing on their own, the collective sourcing came together as a digital um, environment where as collaborators, as professional development, we shared our online learning experiences with each other so that this has become a living bank of digital learning and teaching. INSEA in, on the global scale did the same thing. This is in April, a conversation I had with the INSEA executive. I serve as an INSEA world counselor. Um, and this conversation was about that studio practice. How did I move the physical um, collaborative studio environment that we know is so important to practice, how did I move that into an individual space but stay together? How did, how did I create connections digitally? But how did I also create the conditions for rich studio practice to happen at home? Two projects um, that indicate for me really interesting ways of working in the, in the post-digital environment and in the post-studio environment. Being So Curious is the first, a project um, that I work on at Science Gallery Melbourne. And the second will be with my teachers. I want to start with this though, that we always as a project acknowledge and pay respect to traditional owners of the lands upon which our campuses are situated at the University of Melbourne. 
So for me, being so curious and learning to teach art in lockdown have shown me why radical collaborations, and if you go back to early artographic practice and artographic inquiry, these radical collaborations of rupture and loss um, and disruption are really important components of the connections of the artist and researcher and teacher. It's the activism sites for public pedagogies to create space for hope and creativity and speculation. A public pedagogy has shifted for me because an art education has not always been a public pedagogy. Often we've had to experience those public pedagogies when we hit museum sites, when we're in galleries, when we're in public art spaces. But the digital now enabled that. The glam sector itself had shifted to a public digital pedagogy site and enabled art education to move move all together from a very often Eurocentric modernist version into a post-digital, uh, post-studio contemporary practice, looking at the kinds of art that were being made by artists today. These are the Psycurious co-researchers that I have um, the great pleasure of working with, uh, a team at the University of Melbourne um, on the left there and on my right, my Psycurious co-research team young people who are a part of the steering committee uh, at Science Gallery. Science Gallery um, are all around the world. We are about to have ours open next year, an important collision space. The Science Gallery work in the liminal space between art and science. For me, those slashes between art, research and teaching are the same interstitial spaces, the spaces where we need to learn to cite new understandings and new knowings. And this is why doing art education or doing arts based and creative research at Science Gallery has been so informative to my own creativity and hope and speculation, but also as a co designer and a co researcher with the communities I work in. What we did in this project was to use a creative research method and a speculative inquiry of engaging with writing and engaging with making as artographers to develop new ways of knowing what it means to be sci curious. What we did was send zines, traveling zines from one house to the next of each co researcher in the team about being sci curious. What does it mean to be sci curious? And how do we use other forms of knowing rather than textual to actually draw the affect and emotion and feeling um, and knowing and being so curious. Here they are woven, knitted, stitched and drawn from one house to the next as the provocation from the front cover to the inside cover to the next cover created opportunities for each of the participants in the study to engage in what it means to be so curious. These included text about being so curious there needed to be rules of engagement and each um, zine, a lo-fi folded paper magazine was sent first with these rules. It's okay to be so curious. So curious means recognizing opportunities to share knowledge. And through artistic work, we came to understand things differently. It's because of the pandemic that we were actually able to do this because we were at home and mailing artworks to each other brought a new understanding of ourselves. It was a radical collaboration. Here's, here's another zine. So Curious is a method, a way of being a community, a connection point, boom, between art and science. Here's one that connected the swarm, the idea of a group of people together creating new ideas while at home, disconnected, but incredibly connected online in our Microsoft Teams site, and through our Zoom research meetings, but together through this male interaction where something would arrive at my home and I could open it as a gift to explore what it meant to be so curious. So curious is, so curious means that we are um, interested in the way that we understand the merging or emerging of ideas and together our intergenerational project developed a new way of understanding psycuriosity as method and psycuriosity as pedagogy.
it really, as a, as a speculative method, enabled us a great shift in thinking about what the ethics of joy is in research. Research that, as I said, is disconnected but connected, an assemblage of ideas, um, a way to encounter a range of happenings. So this is further explored with my teachers, becoming teachers, secondary art and design teachers, learning to learn online at the same time as learning to teach online because that's how they did their placements. They did their internships online as activist art teachers. Here we are at the beginning of the year. Melbourne had been in terrible um, fire circumstances. The, the, the sky was filled with smoke and heavy sitting on the ground. We're in our studio here, the multi-purpose um, award-winning design studio at um, the Melbourne Graduate School of Education after three hours of drawing and experiencing what it means to be artographers in the studio. Here we are with doc, Dr, Dr. Patsy Botkin, um, from the National College of Art and Design who had visited us, visited us from Ireland during that time in January and February. And then March, we go home. But COVID-19 became a hopeful creative space for me because it enabled me to open the broader digital ecosystem for art education that in the physical digital, physical studio I wasn't able to do, but in the digital studio I could. Here we are connected in our home studios, in our home study environments, ready to learn at the beginning of this, not realizing that we would be home for so long. But what my students were able to do was turn their um, experience into digital, post-digital spaces where they could develop and design new ways of thinking about teaching each other learning with each other through digital circumstances. Here's a beautiful piece of paper art developed through a YouTube clip that was presented um, in the Zoom class. And then we would leave the Zoom studio and we would head out into our home studios, produce work, photograph them, and then share them back into these large portfolio padlets that kept us connected to each other. Uh, th this is one visual arts and design in a virtual campus from this semester where work was able to be um, reflected upon, re-engaged with, rethought about and shared very differently to even the hanging experience that would have gone on in the walls in the studio. So you saw that picture earlier. Uh, our curriculum includes present and perform and I'm very, um, it's built into every part of the curriculum that I have as an artographer, that we produce work, we reflect upon it, we share it, we discuss it, and we feedback loop that work back in. These digital walls enabled me to do that form of radical collaboration in the post-digital, post-studio environment. A piece of work from one of those by Steffi Domovsky, clear, clear Lungs on Country, after a walking methodology that I asked my students to engage with to deeply listen to country, on the one hour a day that they were allowed out. And in doing so, they were able to meditatively use walking as methodology, as a part of artography to think about where they were living and working and the ancestors and elders and owners of the country and how that might re-engage them in a new way of understanding what it means to be an art educator and why art and design matter in schools. Here's a kind of further theoretical Padlet board where each um, student in my art and design class is able to explore the futures of art education and what do their research need to do to engage a futures post-COVID, post-digital, post-studio environment. They, they came up with the most amazing projects that socially engaged practice and community arts practices needed to drive a change, that schools... Um, moving from the pre-digital to the digital to the post-digital um, needed to rethink what it was that the art world was doing to ensure that kids coming through the ecology into the art world were responsive to the contemporary art space, that, that they could read memes and GIFs as artworks, that they could understand the post-internet practice, that they would be able to engage with critical art making in the digital space, and that they would have the visual literacies and languages to do that. To do that, we explored these large, big tanglegrams, 
um, ways of exploring through text as image and data and feeding that data back out into the Padlet boards for wider feedback in the collective, publishing your research, um, openly um, talking about our research as artographers and then feeding it back into curriculum designs. And it was all done online. We have, we have radically changed what it means to be an activist teacher and to think about points of activisms to decolonise curriculum, to decolonise pedagogies, and to ensure that our art education students are ready um, to read contemporary works and that through the reading of contemporary works, they're, they're engaged and knowledgeable to read historical works, but with new languages, new ways of understanding beyond the art elements and principles of design, ways of experiencing as artist and audience, as the Australian curriculum says, ways of experiencing as spectators and audiences, but underpinning that as practitioners. Practitioner is the key point in all of this work. Um, to understand hope and creativity and speculation is to have a shared collective experience of practice, to move everyone together as practitioners through practice, um, as practice, and, and that within that practice, we're actually able to engage in a shared understanding. This is a page from one of the zines that my art teachers were sending each other. Our pandemic zines kept us connected, um, just like the Psycurious project, but they also enabled us to create new collegial friendships so that when this cohort graduate, um, who did know each other physically in the, in the beginning of the, of the program, we'll, we'll be able to connect with the textual and visual aspects of the zines that they sent so carefully to each other's homes. Thank you very much. Thank you, for Dr. Catherine, for the presentation. I think it's really interesting that uh, yeah, the, the condition could provide a new and creative ways in in, in, both in methodology and also in, in art, uh, art practice. Uh, there is a, uh, I think we, I have uh, five points from your presentation. Correct me if, if my uh, resume is not uh, correct. First is how the harsh conditions of the pandemic in Australia especially still could create new creativity in doings and presenting arts. And we have a uh, three condition uh, in, in terms of interaction. So in the pre-digital, uh, pre uh, we have interaction in one to more peoples, but lack of interaction. So like uh, if we have something, then we cannot uh, get some feedbacks back. And the, the second one is the digital interaction, one-on-one, -on -one, yeah, like, like if we are doing like some, some kinds of uh, digital communication. And uh, the last one is uh, post-digital, with one connects with many. So we, we have uh, one that uh, we, we can connect with so many others uh, uh, resources. Yeah. And I think that's also uh, creates uh, different uh, challenges. And the, the third point is uh, about the post-digital. So that the post-digital provide a collective space for digital learning and uh, teaching in arts and new ways to collaborate, not only with uh, virtual connection, but with doing artworks at homes too. And I, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I found it pretty uh, interesting in Sky Couriers that a collaborative with expressing uh, emotion uh, one by one, sequentially. So what we think, what I think about, about Sky, uh, Sky Couriers, then I send it to my colleague and then my colleague then uh, doing something too. And then they, they send it to another colleagues. And so we have like artworks that connects uh, every one of us and uh, we have discussion online, but we still connected through what we are doing uh, by making some artworks. And I think uh, the last point from the um, uh, uh, Dr. Catherine uh, presentation is that uh, although COVID is uh, make things quite difficult for us, but it also provide uh, some uh, chances yeah, in providing a post-digital studio that provide new kinds of engagement and interaction. Uh, and also we could share uh, its other ideas online and not only yeah, through, through like virtual ways, but also we can make it to like uh, a real, yeah, a real connection with doing things yeah, and, and share it. 
So we have uh, open uh, many collaborative uh, space uh, uh, that can enrich our uh, artworks and also our uh, uh, <clears throat> our insight about arts. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And Mr. Catherine, uh, are you still there? Oh, hello, <laughs> I'm on. Uh, that was a perfect summary, <laughs> thank you. Okay, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, how's the, the, uh, in Australia right now? I heard that there will be another a second uh, lockdown at Australia. Uh, we hope not. We we yeah. have a lockdown um, process. So, in Adelaide at the moment, they have a cluster, um, and so what the um, what each state or community does is lock that uh, lock that section down. Um, so I realise when you look at those numbers at the start of my data that Australia actually has low numbers in comparison to most of the world. Um, but we've had, um, because we had an elimination strategy, that's why we have been in such tight restrictions and isolation. So as soon as there's a cluster of 20 cases or more, which really is very small, that might only be one or two families, uh, we, we go back to lockdown. Yeah, but I'm, I'm really happy to, to hear that even in the yeah, difficult condition of the COVID, but it didn't stop you and other colleagues in art to doing some inventions, like some innovation about doing arts and also about uh, teaching. In I thought it was an opportunity. You know, sometimes in art education, um, we, we lament, we get, we get kind of a bit cranky about the things that we can't change. And, and so we wait for these moments. And to me, this was the moment of change. If I didn't harness it and I didn't make a change now, I was mm -hmm. never going to be able to. This was, this was the time in life to actually say, art education matters because it provides, um, it provides a platform to understand who I am in relation to bigger complex things that are happening in the world. Um, mm -hmm. And so I needed to, I needed to harness what art was and what art education was and to use all of the different connections and collaborations that I had to get them working together. Yeah, I think, yeah, what, what you endure is, I think what most of us also feel and also face in every day, especially in art school, yeah, we usually we have uh, come face to face with students to teach and yeah, to, to, yeah, to encourage them to, to create artworks. But now it, it's like this long this, uh, distance uh, learning, it's quite difficult for us to, to, to adapt at that condition. Yeah, okay. so we need, we need to give them the agency. They, they need to see that art is powerful. Art, art makes you powerful. And if you realize that, then it doesn't need to be made in one space. It can be like we saw in the keynote before, it can be made online, it can be made in your backyard, it can be made in your kitchen or your bathroom. It doesn't matter. That, that's the thing that we need to teach people. It doesn't need to be made in universities. It doesn't need to be made in studios. Art, art, art is the thing that changes the way we understand the world. And it's also a language. And if we teach it that way, then it's not, it's not even about us. We're, we're just the people that provide those opportunities to people. Okay. Thank you for the, the insight, uh, Dr. Catherine. Uh, I Thank think you for having me. After, after this, we have a session after the, all the speakers has, has been speaking. So I think uh, we will continue to our uh, spec, uh, second uh, speaker for today. So we would like to, uh, we would like to welcome for the Dr. Steve Arisa Smith or Smith from the State University of Fresno, California, United uh, uh, USA. Salamat sore, ibu ibu, papa papa, dari Amerika Serikat. Nama saya Steve Adisa Smito Smith. Uh, sebaiknya saya harus berbahasa Inggris untuk presentasi saya. Maaf ya. And thank you for this for inviting me to this conference uh, where we're using digital platforms to share across time and space. So we're literally different sides of the globe and separated by quite a distance in time. And yet we overcome that distance to find a way of sharing ideas and sharing understandings. And that's what I want to talk about in artistic terms, uh, how text and art forms are being shared in new performances in digital uh, modes and digital technology. In our contemporary world, as we try to understand each other from standpoints in diverse cultures, we face a twofold problem. First, how, in a complex world at a distance, do we achieve effective dynamic understanding 
of other cultures via their arts, literary, and visual. Second is the ethical problem of representation. We have to avoid the two extremes. On the one hand, exclusion, not including representing other cultures in our considerations and studies at all. On the other hand, we represent other cultures, we can represent other cultures in a way that assimilates them, appropriation. So those are the two extremes I'd like to avoid. The problem is especially acute in cases of an imbalance of power between larger dominant communities and smaller scale minority communities. Fortunately, new bridges to understanding are being built. For one thing, all humans have a common neural architecture and psychology. Recent research in cognitive psychology shows that the brain encodes information in interacting narrative and visual form. Goals I'm after and the, uh, the problems that I want to overcome. So the brain has a common neural architecture. We share narrative and visual forms. Visual art and literature can amplify each other with mutual gain and knowledge transfer and emotional charge. Similarly, Right? There's the transfer of information through di digital technology and the internet can open door to unprecedented intercultural exchanges. New media, the integration of artistic performances allows us to better address the true problems of understanding and aesthetics. Sorry, understanding and ethics. Various indigenous cultures now are performing their own stories illustrated with their own art to share a dynamic understanding of their voices and visions as participants in the world. So I'm going to illustrate this today uh, by a, showing you a clip from an indigenous Maori performance of one of their traditional tales, Maui Chikichiki Ataranga, uh, translated in English as How Maui Found His Mother. Now, my own background, I come from comparative literature, which traditionally focused primarily on text. And there's a Sanskrit text in Devanagari, uh, transliteration, and then translation into English. So this field realized literature as a, an art form, and you wanted to try to get a full understanding of it, right? And when you're going at a distance culturally and in terms of language, there's always an issue of translation and context and understanding. The context on the one hand, in order to understand something, you have to understand the context, but when you're removed in time or cultural distance, then context can be a problem, right? So if you decontextualize it and you don't understand it in terms that are equivalent to the way the original community would have understood it, then you've misunderstood it, misrepresented it. Uh, Hans George Gadamer came up with this idea of horizons of understanding that were always, it, the way he conceived it is we're trying to fuse horizons as we communicate and understand more and more. Another hermeneutical philosopher, Paul Ricoeur, understand it, understood it as the uh, expansion of horizons that are always growing and spreading. Recur has a concept he calls the hermeneutical function of distanciation, and he points out that texts, first of all, are a break with the dynamism of phenomenon, it's a phenomenology, events in the world. You take the events of the world and you create an artificial expression, a text, a literary work. It's an ensemble of signs, but it is not the world itself, and yet it has to relate somehow to the world itself or the world or it's meaningless. And then the reader approaches this text and they have to read it and make sense of it. Again, there's a distance that's involved there uh, and they make sense of it in terms of their own experience. But the effort to overcome that distance, Recur argues, is a productive one because you get distance from yourself, some perspective on yourself and that allows you to understand yourself better. So you emerge from the act of reading with a better self-understanding. So the other thing that changed my understanding of text and, and getting to know the context of ancient India, they studied in India for a short while, they were quite comfortable with representing stories in artistic form. For example, in sculptures and friezes. Uh, there are thousands of examples from across India especially during the Gupta Empire, uh, classical India. On the left is the uh, representation of a scene of Draupadi and the five Pandava brothers from the Shavatar temple. Um, Gupta Empire was a cosmopolitan international empire. You would know it in Indonesia because they had trading relationships with Sri Vijaya in the Southeast. Borobudur, the temple in Java, has similar uh, carvings depicting the life of the Buddha. So the idea that stories can be told in visual form, stories need to be visualized to be understood, 
And iconography has a narrative aspect to it. Those two have been intermingled for a long time. It's not just in ancient South Asia, Southeast Asia. Uh, it's also around the world. So for example, the Mayan Popol Vuh, this is the Codex Dresden here. The uh, script of Mayan is already intensely pi pictographic to begin with, and they call the Popol Vuh a vision book, and you would open it and there would be illustrations accompanying every episode. Uh, another example from uh, medieval Ireland, the Book of Kells, is illustrating stories from the Gospels with rich uh, illustration of the letters themselves, turning them into the letters into pieces of art, and illustrations of the scenes that are going on to the side. So this is not a new idea, in other words. What is new is our understanding of how it works. So I've been trying to keep abreast of recent developments in cognitive neuroscience over the past few decades. Um, and a particular work that bears on literature is uh, Dahan's Reading in the Brain. And this is what he points out is involved. Not the old, the, the, the top picture there has an older understanding, very linear and very simple. Now they know and they can trace what happens as you read and understand. It goes from the visual perceptions of letters to the letterbox of the brain, or if you're hearing the story, it could be auditory perception of sounds and have a different starting point. But then from both, it passes to the places where sound images are stored in the brain, the phonic areas, the place where meanings are stored, the semantic areas, and then in less than a second, triggers other centers. Motor systems that get your heart beating and send your blood rushing as you read an engaging story. The mirror neuron systems that allow you to represent the actions of others in yourself as though you're doing them yourself, right? Which uh, may have implications for empathy. The visual, ethical, social models, the modules, those parts are interlinked. We visualize faces, social information, and our ethical judgments are being processed through that area, as well as the left hemisphere, the rational ordering uh, uh, parts of the brain. All of that is involved in every aspect of reading. And of course, it's involved every time there's a performance of any other art as well. Um, there's a new uh, field in uh, media psychology is also looking at how storytelling affects the brain, and they can trace this now, what's going on. It opens up a new understanding. So more is now known about visual, textual, and narrative processing in the brain than ever before. That's a picture of Stanislas de Han. Uh, he's from Collège de France and has a neuroimaging uh, project. He studied how mathematics is processed in the brain, the number sense, how literacy is processed there, reading the brain, awareness itself, consciousness in the brain. And most recently this year, he came out with a new book, How We Learn. And he talked about four pillars of learning. These are brain processes, neural processes that are involved in all learning for all people in the planet, right on the planet. Gaining and holding attention is the first. Active engagement, you've got to work through it in some way. Uh, Feedback and error correction is another, and integration or consolidation is a fourth. A particular note to us of interest for literature and visual arts, uh, the two together are trying to grab the attention. They don't work unless they do, and visuals are very good for that, getting attention. Active engagement, working through, especially if you have more than one mode going on at the same time. So you're reading the text or hearing a, a spoken tale and looking at the pictures as they dynamically unfold. And this all helps with consolidation of the integration at the end, bringing the two together. So, so there are new tools and new understandings that are emerging. That's all to the good. The ethical problems still remain, right? The ethics of representation. And I mentioned this before, the two polar uh, opposites, exclusion and appropriation. So what I mean to expand on that a bit, right? This is an incredibly diverse world, right? Over 7,000 different languages that are still around. If we lose touch with that, we've lost, it's a tremendous loss, right? The perspectives and experiences of all those different people are not part of our understanding or our studies. If those people are not representing themselves, however, then that's also an ethical problem. These are their artistic creations. These are their story traditions. And that is the set, you know, so if all that's excluded, it's just a loss. If we include it in the wrong way, that's the second problem, appropriation. It can amount to cultural theft, right? That you're taking from them. 
or you misrepresent because you misunderstand what's going on. You hide behind a mask. It's a kind of imposture, right? <clears throat> Rather than a performance, it's an imposture. Now, I say those are two polar extremes. There's lots of creative ground in the middle. And one potential solution that has arisen is collaborative performance. Performances that draw on different people from different cultural standpoints, and they together offer a new understanding. And that's, I'm gonna give you an example of this. In order to make that point though, I want you to experience the opposite, the text alone and told in a problematic way. So the tale of Maui, right, the, the Polynesian trickster figure, and I'm uh, focusing on his Maori uh, representation, his Maori version, um, very famous, has become more famous recently because of San Louis. Um, <clears throat> this is the story of his birth and his childhood, his, his homecoming. And it was collected by W.D. Westerfeld in 1910, right, Legends of Maui, and to give Westerfeld credit, he was a serious folklorist from the U.S. Uh, he went to the Pacific and he collected all the Polynesian tales he could and knew there were many different versions and, and gathered a lot of them together, and all that's to the good. On the other hand, he was a Christian missionary, that's his standpoint, and uh, he had a rather diminished view of what these tales were about. Uh, this, by the way, is the version that's most often taught in American universities here in the U.S., um, and this is why it's problematic. Uh, he thought the stories of Maui were the rude mythical survival. This is a quote of an era without religion or civil government when every man was a law unto himself. So in this version, this is the entire story that he gives. It is not the entire traditional Maori story, by the way. It's a reduced version. But let's look at it. Maui is prematurely born, his mother not caring to be troubled with him, uh, cut off a lock of her hair, tied it around him, cast him in the sea. So the mother doesn't care at all. She's not even named, by the way. It's not worth naming. And she just doesn't want to be troubled and throws her baby out into the ocean like you do with a premature child, right? <clears throat> Uh, in this way, his name came to him, Maui Chiki Chiki, Maui formed in the top knot. The waters bore him safely. The jellyfish enwrapped him in motherhood. So his mother didn't care for him, but the jellyfish mothered him. The unnamed god of the seas cared for and protected him, was carried to the god's house, hung up on the roof, and he was cherished into life by the warmth of the fire. Right? No mention of a community. The other figures, the, the people who are there, the gods, aren't named. No mention of his childhood, just simply when he was old enough. He came to his relations, no mention of the journey there, while they were all gathered in the great house of assembly, dancing and making merry. Now, there's a hint of a community behind this, a hint of their culture and artistic traditions. They have a house of assembly where they meet. There's a dance that they perform, but that's it. It's just a hint. Little Maui crept in, and he has to creep in, and sat down behind his brothers. As soon as mother called the children, found a strange child who had to prove he was her son, and then he was taken in. Okay, that is, that, and that's it. That is the entire story that Westerfeld records. Now, let me introduce you to the more recent, in fact, a century later, uh, 2010, 2010, the Maori television told their version of the story as a collaborative effort. effort. And I'm gonna show you a small section of it. It's from a longer series called Amaui Maui, uh, the traditional Maui, Maori legend uh, was retold in English by an author who had links and roots in the Maori community. He wasn't Maori himself, but he married a Maori woman, and he had links there, and he was in collaboration with Maori, Maori artists, and he worked their art forms into his book. And this is an example of his form. He, he did this as a children's book. And he incorporates elements of their uh, visual arts, right? The flowing lines, the spirals, the internested triangles. More on those later. Uh, <clears throat> so they took this retelling and then they did a further retelling. A Maori narrator and storyteller back translated it into Maori. So you'll hear that in a second. Uh, the person is Mary Mary Penfold. Uh, she did that. The tale itself is decisively placed in Maori communities and showcases their way of life. The result is a new Maori performance, 
proudly broadcast on Maori television. The story is more humane and communal, and I would argue more engaging. I'm going to show you the second half of the tale after Maui's found on the beach by his uncle Ranga. As you watch, note the artistic style of flowing lines, spiral korus. Koru is a fern curl. You'll see examples. The spiral is a very developed example. Uh, you'll see more in the video. So notice the way the tail integrates flowing lines and spiral designs with a focus on the community and its narrative even becomes kind of a spiral. Uh, now, I didn't show you the opening of the tale, but Maui's mother sadly gave him up because he was apparently stillborn, and with a prayer consigned him to the waves, after lovingly bundling Maui in her hair. The baby is nourished by the elements, but they're drawn with a flowing Maori lineation, depicted as loving natural forces, each is personified with a face decorated with kaumoko tattoos. Maui is found and saved by his uncle, Ranga, arrayed as a traditional Maori elder. But Ranga inducts Maui as a boy into Maori culture, teaching him how to relate to nature, spiritual forces, how to perform as a member of Maori society. Even one of Maui's trademarks, powers, magic powers, shape-shifting, is brought back into service for the community. When his cooing as a pigeon transforms into a work song that unites the men in their collaborative effort. The paz, or communities, are linked with arrays of triangles to depict the closeness of the community, and they're drawn in traditional colors of black, red, and white which symbolize potential becoming and full being. There's a little philosophy worked in there. This narrative, Koru, 
unfolds in growth and progress with Maui gaining power before curling back to his home pa. As a young man, desire, Maui desires to reconnect with his mother and birth family. He heroically journeys to her community. Still a trickster, he slips back into the family lineup. But after declaring his identity, it is Maui's own narrative that reconnects him to his mother. There's a moment of mutual recognition and a joyful, tearful reunion sealed with a honey. That's the down here, right? The nose to nose mingling of breath. Maui, Maui reconnects with both his mother and their community. The tale now is a visual artistic performance. It spirals out from Maui's mother, flowing with the ocean waves, gains power at the periphery with his uncle, and then spirals back home, back to his home, which becomes his base for further adventures, a narrative koru. So since this is now in this form, I was able to share it during the COVID crisis with my students in the U.S. And rather than uh, relying on a story told by an outsider who had diminished it and dehumanized it, really, they get a much richer sense of what's going on. <clears throat> they have an encounter with spoken voice, traditional arts, visual arts, and the engaging narrative. This multimodal presentation amplifies the meaning. It's an enriched text and art form. And I would argue a new art form. The interweaving of text and uh, <clears throat> of visuals creates a new kind of experience. When I say new, it's new because of the digital technology and the form it takes. It's actually fulfilling a dream of ancient India of classical Sanskrit, the dream of a total performance. So, for example, the plays in classical India are called Drishya Kavya, visual literature, poems that are to be seen. They combine actors, dancers, music, mime, dialogue, and poems. And we're now returning to that kind of idea in these new digital forms. It's a new kind of experience. Like raw phenomenal experience, several modes of information are drawn together to, co to create a coherent experience in the brain. It functions similarly to what uh, C.S. Peirce called uh, uh, interpretance, a sign that is developed by another sign so it becomes more meaningful. Now, Peirce, being a, in the hard sciences and a mathematician, talked about dynamic objects, and he tended to have a more schematic view of what was going on. I approach more from phenomen phenomenology and therefore talk about dynamic events. Human experience is complex. And the events we go through call for interpretation and expression, and those are an interweaved brand. And what you have in this new integrated performance is a kind of artistic interpretant, right? It's integrating all these different forms and creating a new virtual experience. That virtual experience helps us to overcome the distance, distance in time and space, distance culturally. We join together and collaborate in speaking and listening in trying to understand. And another uh, uh, benefit is that as a digital form, it can be stored so that we can experience it later, just like you're going to experience this uh, talk hours later after I've given it. So it's a new, a new time, right? <clears throat> Sharing arts and narratives for cross-cultural understanding, text, visuals, music, and other art forms are generating a virtual experience of unfolding process. The performance of culture, or rather culture as synchronized performance and mutual understanding. Thank you very much for listening and for allowing me to present to you. Sampai jumpa. Uh, thank you, Dr. Steve, for the presentation. So if, if, you, if you are here, then I uh, so, uh, would like to say hello to you. Good to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. you. Yeah, uh, I'm. Uh, we are fine, and uh, it's a very interesting presentation uh, you have about uh, collaborative art and how, like, uh, the the use of uh, many mediums could like provide us more experience in uh, enjoying and also in learning about new art forms and also about a new uh, culture from different parts of uh, the world. So uh, I think one of the points in the, your presentation is about that uh, the visual and auditory perception uh, triggered at the centers of our mind. So therefore, it, this could be implemented in creating diverse medium of communication using uh, various uh, media. and. Uh, 
uh, many version of uh, uh, the many version and medium in telling uh, native stories could provide opportunity to collaborate and opens for further understanding and insight for the audience, especially from different uh, cultural background. It is like providing a more complete experience through various uh, senses, like you, you can see the, the art, you can hear, and you can also uh, see the performance. So it, it gives you more experience, more uh, insights about uh, the new, uh, the art form, uh, the art that we are uh, uh, en enjoying. And I think the, the last one is this uh, multimodal presentation uh, could amplify uh, the meaning that we can enrich a text and art form and that would provide new experience for the audience <laughs> thank you dr steve thank you interesting uh, uh, presentation uh, so i think uh, uh, we will have a, a question and answer session after the last uh, speaker of this session so yeah. so please uh, don't go away. We will come back with you later <laughs> after the session. <laughs> Thank you. Same and all. And so we move to our third presenter for this the first session. So we would like to have a presentation from uh, Dr. Onno We Purbo. Uh, please uh, have a seat and listen to the presentation. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Ono Purbo. Uh, I will talk about online teaching and experience art and culture during coronavirus and beyond. Thank you very much, Bu Nuning and all the organizer of the conf uh, art conference to allowing me to talk on this conference. Uh, to be honest, my background is not an artist. <laughs> I am an engineer by, by training. <laughs> uh, so I will not, I will not talk about the art itself, but I will talk more on the uh, platform or the technology that can, we can use for online teaching and experiencing art and culture during the uh, uh, social distancing because of the coronavirus. Okay. Uh, uh, this paper can be downloaded from uh, this website, onocenter.or.id. You can click publication here and you can download the uh, paper the online teaching and experience art and culture of coronavirus from 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 this website okay uh, so it's available online uh, i will talk about three major uh, focus in this talk first from the uh, user point of view not from the artist from the user how can we visit uh, museum galleries all over the world from home so from the user for as well as uh, how can we listen or discuss with the art the actual artist online okay so this is from the uh, user point of view uh, and then I will talk about the uh, post pandemic teaching uh, how we can teach art using the uh, online course platform or uh, doing some hybrid activity between online and uh, uh, hybrid means from with online and uh, course and uh, talking to the actual uh, common people on the internet. So the formal course and the informal uh, community uh, environment. Okay, so the post-pandemic teaching, uh, we will likely to see like that kind of hybrid between the formal and informal. Okay, and the last one is the technology. How can we embrace technology for virtual gallery exhibition and art experience? Okay, uh, of course the uh, pandemic force us to do physical distancing. So physical distancing is a growing reality. Uh, we cannot escape from physical distancing. So sooner or later, we have to do many of these things online, basically. Okay. Uh, the, the important things, uh, so in the past, we can enjoy bloom of art activities across all media, performance, visual art, movie, and so on. But now, uh, 
we have different ways we can uh, we can do a cultural and artistic participant from our couch while sheltering in place okay so in experiencing art and culture uh, we can visit galleries or museum all over the world from home uh, we can became a virtual group trotters to see exhibit art and learning materials over 1200 uh, museum worldwide with google art and culture this is the important one of course there are there are other example but this is so big so google art and culture is so big we can see their website this is their website google art, uh, art and culture uh, you can zoom many things here you can download even from google play and app store okay uh, you uh, you can look uh, for games places museum artwork we can explore these things and many things here uh you can zoom in to art project uh art filter and so on okay now uh maybe we are more interesting in uh, enjoying something nearby to us so there is a nearby uh menu here in art and culture.google.com i will click nearby so this is nearby of my place okay so this is in Jakarta. You can see in North Jakarta we have some uh, several arts or galleries in Central Jakarta, Tangerang, and so on. I will go to the Indonesian uh, National Museum. Okay, we can click here. Uh, we can view in Google and Art and Culture. This is how it looks like. But the important menu is this one. The uh, small yellow guy here. Wow, this is another art uh, uh, is passing me. Uh, sorry, uh, I need to. Oh, uh, I need to pause. Okay, sorry for the background music. This is the local art, <laughs> music, musician. They are passing my presentation. So you are interested in the uh, little yellow guy over here? We can click this so we can view the uh, actual art in the actual environment we can click one of them and then we can move forward and see how the exhibition looks like in the museum this is 3d we can do some virtual tour here okay so this is the example of google art and culture uh, platform here of course we need to coordinate with google if we want our gallery uh, goes into their maps and do some virtual uh, exhibition like this okay uh, I don't know how much we have to pay I think some of them are actually free okay now in addition to the uh, oops sorry in addition to oops sorry uh, in addition to the uh, virtual visit to museum and galleries uh, uh, social distancing is actually allow us to interact with the art school uh, see their digital thesis uh, follow our school social media account and also the interesting thing is we can uh, hearing podcasts especially for artists uh, or youtube uh, broadcast some of the uh, current favorite is the uh, map curator kimberly drew about art and radical accessibility for example okay let's see uh, this is the uh, search result for podcast curator kimberly drew you can click here in podcast apple and then we can uh, play and hear what she's saying internship at the city museum in harlem one on eight okay i stop <laughs> you can always hear it <laughs> if you like okay in on youtube you can see the uh, same thing here uh, you can find a lot of her lecture here. This is one of her lecture. This is in January 9, 2020 in, on YouTube. And Excuse me, at Creative Time. Uh, you can listen uh, on, uh, on her lecture. Okay. So you can interact basically with many artists, with many curators on art all over the world, on podcasts, on YouTube, and everything. Okay, so that's from the uh, user point of view. From the school point of view, 
of course uh, in normal school point of view we can use the uh, uh, massive online open online course okay uh, massive open online course is quite uh, normal for many schools now uh, we use Moodle mostly for this kind of thing I'm sure at the art school at ITB they have Moodle also running for their courses uh, for other school uh, it's very easy to install actually but if you don't have the capacity to install one you are welcome to use my uh, <laughs> uh, not massive like, like uh, we have a free uh, e-learning platform at lms.onocenter.or.id slash model you are welcome to use it uh, we have 40,000 students in this platform right now we have 700 courses for free okay so you are welcome to use this thing uh, but in reality the uh, teaching process is actually blending merging between the formal course and informal interaction with the community outside the uh, school environment okay so the blending process can be uh, can be as to get creative and build community for example one of the examples of this is art archive challenge you can see the art archive challenge in in instagram or uh, they have their own website actually uh show you a little bit what uh this this is their website you can search on google and you will find the artworkarchive.com this is their website uh this basically interaction between the real art professionals and the art enthusiasm uh they can share work and so on and they have competition they have contests on instagram okay uh on art Okay, so this is some of the uh, results uh, you can check on Instagram this is the Instagram on artwork archive uh, the uh, this is the artwork they have uh, put uh, this is put by many many people okay on Instagram of course uh, in addition to get creative and build community uh, some galleries some museum actually set up a hashtag for example this is museum moment of zen hashtag uh, firstly posted by museum of city of new york and and is now used by many museum to attract people or to tell people about their collection you can uh, check on uh, twitter on instagram and so on so this is I checked the uh, hashtag Museum Moment of Zen on Twitter and this is uh, some of the museum was actually posting this is only six hours ago uh, in the Wendy Museum okay this is some of the uh, this is High Museum of Art this is Jetty Museum this is Westfield History Museum uh, so many museums so they are putting their uh, collection sample of their collection on twitter on instagram that way people knows what's inside the museum so uh, this is how the uh, communication built among between the museum and the community or the artist itself himself sorry okay uh, of course you can use uh, other other keyword for finding art for example i use modern art uh, keyword on twitter you can find a lot of things on modern art which is quite amazing okay so that's how we interact okay now let's go to the more practical tools you have several options for practical tools uh there are two people i like to mention here uh, that is rega octaviana uh, rega octavian uh, octavian rega at gmail.com he is a graduate student in art department at itb uh, in his past time he actually built the cube virtual space okay this is how it look like uh, the cube virtual space i have to go to my <laughs> sorry my folder okay uh, FSRD here 
This is uh, his video on the Q virtual space. Uh, so people can go inside the uh, virtual space, exhibition space basically. Uh, an artist can put their exhibition, uh, their, uh, their results, their product, their artwork in this space and we can look uh, we can enjoy their uh, product uh, their artwork from here okay interestingly this is my made by an art student so uh, anyone can build these things actually okay the second one is Muhammad Ari Kurniawan his background is game programming uh, he's my son's friend and he actually built this one okay he actually worked for a real estate company for uh, exhibiting their uh, houses so no <laughs> no no voice no no audio uh, so we can go here and go here and we can actually go inside the house let me go inside the house enter sorry enter the house here so we can so so it's very similar to art gallery but this is for houses but you can put a lot of details here you can uh, build uh, uh, what's that uh, uh, this is only television but actually you can put any artwork here uh, put it in close up in details uh, so people can enjoy how it looks like okay uh, this is made by Indonesians, uh, Ari Kurniawan. Okay, now the other tool we are, uh, I have to stop this one. Okay, the other, the other tools uh, you can view in the paper. There are quite a lot of tools we can use. Some of them actually free and open source. Open 3, Space 3D, for example. This is open free, uh, open space 3D. Uh, we have option to download the uh, software for free. Okay, so you can download the open space 3D for uh, for free. The problem is you need to uh, you need to have some uh, what uh, programming well sort of programming ability to use these things. Okay. The other one is also open source, this one. So there are two open source uh, applications. This is Marzipano, 360 media viewer for modern web. It's free. Uh, you can download on GitHub. Uh, this is some of the demo. Uh, so you can enter here, for example. So you can look around. Uh, there is a pointer here. So you can enter the exhibition, you can look around here, and you can enter another exhibition, you can look around here, enter another exhibition, to look around. So basically, it's available, uh, the source code, and you, you need to put up the uh, picture, the graphics, and so on. Okay. The other one is, the, the rest is mainly, uh, it's they call it free, but uh, they are looking uh, you have to pay later uh, sooner or later you, you need to pay otherwise uh, uh, for example if you we want to have more feature we want to be more uh, more uh, attractive and so on we need to pay so there is pricing this is Lapentor okay uh, this one interesting uh, make VT uh, we can create virtual tour here oops okay virtual tour like here like this <laughs> too fast okay uh, like this okay this is make VT this one is uh, fitility okay same thing we, we need to uh, the artists need to upload the pictures mostly after pictures uh, upload some uh, some storytelling and so on so we can do the same thing for real estate on fitility Okay, so we can do virtual tool with infinity. Yeah, uh, so a lot of things here. This is art steps. Several Indonesian has used this one, art steps. Uh, you can do a lot of uh, interesting thing here. So uh, also in California and so on. So that's the platform. 
the artist need to upload mostly the uh, storytelling, the uh, picture, and so on. But if you like to make the actual art uh, on the computer 3D, there are several tools. Uh, these two are I have uh, uh, I uh, I have found two tools from Google. Tilt brush. Uh, basically, you can uh, make 3D brush, 3D pictures on your computer. Okay. Uh, the name of the uh, application is tiltbrush.com and the other one is the uh, poly.google.com is for uh, exploring 3D world. Uh, so we can build a 3D world and we can explore it, for example, this one. Uh, so we can build our own 3D world and we can explore and then people can see the uh, actual product in 3D. So this is uh, not taking pictures of the uh, physical product, we actually creating the product on computer, 3D product on computers. Okay, uh, so that's some of the uh, options we have uh, for the end users, for the end user visiting galleries, for the technology and the uh, teaching process. And I hope it can give some idea on online teaching and experiencing art and culture during coronavirus and beyond. Thank you very much. So thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Ono, about the for the presentation. It's also interesting to have a perspective from the consumer, so from, from the, the art sector. So thank you. From point, uh, I could uh, make a resume of first that pandemic opened uh, the opportunity to visit various places and events that is only quite difficult to visit in person, right? In person, do to call second and having to call in connection with various arts. The pandemic also enabled us to have a virtual interaction with various art schools, creators, artists, those are this form, podcast, YouTube, etc. And uh, the third one is artists could also venture into these new art new platforms by going digitally, by doing online exhibition using various media to connect with the uh, art uh, collectors and also uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Very pleased to meet you, um, Doctor Ono. <laughs> Sorry, your sound is like uh, I don't know. There is a problem on on my network, I guess. Okay. Uh, the sound is not smooth enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. So I think uh, we now can continue to our uh, question and uh, answer uh, session. So, for those who has uh, who, uh, who has already uh, provided questions, then we can uh, start the discussion. So now we have uh, three uh, speakers. We have uh, Dr. Catherine, uh, Dr. Steve, and also Dr. Ono. So I would like to begin the, the session uh, with a question from uh, from Professor uh, Associate Professor uh, Tarmiji. So Professor uh, Tarmiji, could you? Open your mic and ask live to uh, Dr. Uh, Catherine, please. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hello, Professor Talmiji. <laughs> How are you? Uh, thank you for inviting invite me to join this uh, amazing conference. Uh, Actually, my, my question uh, goes to, uh, I think, for all of the panels is about uh, the role of the virtual exhibition in the COVID-19 era. Uh, because of the COVID-19 effect, everything has gone digital, uh, including the virtual art exhibition that uh, has imaging and trending the field of art. Uh, but the issue is 
is there any needs to create a uh, standard rule that uh, must be followed by who want to organize the virtual exhibition so that is does not become a mess in the art discipline thank you very much professor tabizi is, is the question for all the three uh, presenters or specific yeah, yeah. okay so please uh, dr catherine dr steve and dr ono to and uh, to have a discussion uh, about uh, this question thank you who would like to go first i can okay i love <laughs> that i love that question so i think uh so i i come from curatorial studies as well um and if i think about my own curatorial um research inside my masters there was very little conversation around what digital environments look like part of my shift into art education includes that digital for a really important reason we are working in um a, a fractured art community where we have post internet post internet artists without art training we have um, post digital artists with and without art training and then we have um, some artists who are working in very specific site based practices that can physical site based practices that can open their audiences through virtual and digital exhibition spaces but it does mean that just like in art education where there's been a catalyst or shift into digital, we also need to do that in curatorial practice. We need to think about what the opportunities are for audience growth and development. We need to think beyond the physical white walls of galleries out into what digital um, collaborative connective opportunities are. And that, that is a shift from digital to post-digital um, that I referred to in my presentation. And I think it's a really important one that we all must make together. If we understand that art is an ecology, that artists, art worlds, art, art students, um, art practitioners, writers, etc., all exist in response and relation to each other. Our, our gallery spaces have got to shift in very quickly. What we saw in Australia during COVID, particularly in Melbourne, has been a rapid shift into digital exhibition. But the mistake they made was that they went out and got the digital artists rather than actually talking to the artists who are working in more traditional studio-based practices and asking them to digitize their work ready for exhibition. And that just shows that there's a, there's a, there's a misunderstanding and that most of the art world is actually still pre-digital. It's reliant on big, heavy cultural sector that, that engages with a physical audience and, and gets its funding from physical spectators and audiences rather than thinking more broadly about a global art community um, and, and developing global opportunities rather than physical walk through the door ticket sales. It'll actually democratize the sector if we do it well. Okay, thank you. From uh, Dr. Catherine, now uh, can we move to uh, Dr. Steve? At my field. <laughs> Uh, so I have no relevant expertise. However, a friend of mine, a colleague, uh, is in digital humanities, and she arranged an exhibit on utopias, and it was mixed media. They did exactly what Catherine was talking about, uh, digitizing different forms, uh, the drawings, the artworks, and the letters, and they did it with a team approach. So they had several uh, graduate students as well as uh, faculty from the library who got together and they all uh, created this wonderful exhibit that was partially digital. This was pre-COVID, so it was also partially in person. Right now, the digital form is accessible uh, in continuity. And there's, there uh, are songs, there are the uh, journals and so forth. So they're digi digitizing different forms of media. And that's the extent of my... <laughs> <laughs> Influence, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Steve. Uh, now, uh, please, uh, Dr. Ono, to answer the question from uh, Professor Tar uh, Tarmizi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I cannot uh, put up my uh, virtual background because otherwise it will mess my face. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, I am not an artist. My background is engineer. Uh, I am helping building the internet in Indonesia. So the mindset in the engineering from the en from the internet or engineering point of view is very simple. We normally like to get consensus on 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 things. So if I map this thing into the art uh, world, uh, what we we are thinking is very simple. If you do a good work, then we acknowledge, we, we make consensus, this is a, a, a good one. If that's okay, we can adopt that, that kind of thing. On the many platform on the internet, like YouTube or uh, media social, they have a capacity to flag, to flag a, a product or a posting. Uh, if this is very, very bad, we can put flag in these things. So this will turn down uh, 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 an art product. If it is not a good one, uh, they will turn down uh, a product from the platform. So it's very brutal, it's very cruel, but that's the reality on the internet. On the other hand, as Dr. Catherine said, it's very interesting. On the internet, internet is not a one-way uh, communication platform. Like if we have an exhibition, it's basically one way from the artist to the community. Internet is two-way communication platform. And Dr. Catherine already mentioned several times, this is a feedback, feedback loop between the community and the artist. So if we can use the internet, I would strongly suggest to to use to maximize the, the uh, feedback communication uh, uh, door or road between the uh, community and the uh, the the artist that will create a much much better product uh, uh, later so uh, we uh, sometimes we see things we we normally digitizing things and put it on the internet but internet have the other option to make a uh, feedback loop uh, communication between the uh, community and the art uh, artist itself. We we need to maximize those things. Otherwise, internet is only one way. Uh, what road? We need to make it into two ways, and we can maximize things. And the uh, process for acknowledgement is it's 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 much greater because distance is no longer what's it? Not long. It's access, but it's it's we can reduce the distance by the internet. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Arno, for the uh, answer. Okay, uh, now we move to another question. This came from one of the audience for the uh, for Dr. Coleman. Uh, the, the, as the question is: Do we, in the same platform, example art for our, for the well-being? Okay. Uh, I hope you get. The <laughs> Questions, Dr. Coleman. Ah, okay, I'm on mute now. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, can you ask me? Can you ask me that question again? Sorry, it was about platforms and well-being. Is that right? Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, I think it's about the, the platform, like maybe what you did in, in the art is also the same if we do it in for the uh, well-being. Yeah, so I think that um, well-being and belonging are two of the most important components of a digital environment. Digital environments enable us to connect to each other in, in ways that we might not physically be able to connect to each other more traditionally. It, so it's not it's not about um, globalization. You you can connect locally, and and if we think about um, what the internet um, was for, and and if we try and harness that, that you know we have an opportunity to think about how we can engage with people through um, through ensuring that we have equity equity around um, equity around distribution of knowledge equity around distribution of wealth. You know, those equities actually come about by a, a respectful, trustful relationships. And those relationships can be built online. We don't need to build relationships in physical spaces. Um, we can use the mediators 
And there's lots of different ways of using the internet and different digital and virtual environments as a mediator, something that sits between. So just like when we go out to dinner and there's a table and the physical site that's between us, if we start to think about what the internet and what digital environments serve as mediators, it, get, it, it allows us to rethink that. I think part of the problem we have is that we think that humans are different to non-human digital things. Um, we, we, haven't, we, we think that humans are far more powerful than anything else, rather than thinking about the power of digital and virtual environments, the, the power of the internet, and actually um, maybe starting to flatten that a little bit. You know, not, not, not shifting the hierarchy, um, but flattening the hierarchy so that we can actually engage and use the mediation spaces to, to create meaningful relationships. That's what wellbeing is about. That's what our mental health is about. Um, meaningful relationships means that we connect, we collaborate. Somebody doesn't have power over or agency over us. One of the difficult things we need to teach in the digital space though, is a literacy. The literacies and capabilities of understanding data trails are incredibly important. The kinds of data trails that we leave behind in digital spaces means that sometimes that mediator that we want to use as a place to gain power actually holds a lot of information about us. Um, and we need to understand what data we leave behind in, in different forms of spaces that can harm our well-being. Um, but it does mean that we need to be, you know, we need to hold as much information as we can about the spaces that we're working in and then try and engage with them, build, build them as safe places. Okay, thank you. Interesting uh, discussions. And I think uh, next for the question is a uh, question for uh, pa, uh, so for Paono. It's also quite interesting. Uh, so we begin with a question from uh, uh, Pa Ono. So this is about uh, about the colors. So we know that there are two types of color: uh, RGB, uh, red, uh, red, green, and blue, and the pigment. We say okay. We are now in the situation that pigment is disappear. In Spain, we only know RGB colors. But we have to <laughs> are, they, are they in in uh, live in the real world? Or they think that they are. The, the, the one color will dominate the other. Wow. <laughs> oh, okay. I give up. <laughs> I give up. Sorry, sorry. I give up. I am very much IT guy. So I give up. <laughs> uh, it's unfair. Uh, to be honest, if I answer, I, I will go to RGB, but I know I'm fair. Um, sorry, sorry. <laughs> On this one, I give up. <laughs> Oh, how, how about if like like now like maybe in the future there will be like domination of like uh, like media from uh, based on screen rather based on 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 like printed uh, media uh possibility of that like what we are doing in, in it uh, world we actually moving from from screen into into real real world actually if you understand 3d printing we actually uh, moving from screen to real world, and now we are moving to big 3D printing. Like we can print uh, what boat, uh, car, machineries. So it, it goes both ways actually, from world into screen, screen to 3D. So it works both way. <laughs> uh, so yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, interesting. <laughs> yeah. And it's a, it's a big business now. 3D printing is a big business now because because very easy for us to design anything. Like say we, we create a product, uh, we just design it on screen and print it uh, directly and we, we have our own product that way. So the design, what, what you have in, in your faculty, design product uh, department, yeah, uh, should go to 3D printing because that's the uh, way to go. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Paono. And next, uh, the question from uh, Arinafro from Sriwijaya University to Dr. Coleman. Art and art education are frequently spoken as creative and important aspects of cultural thinking, values, and problem solvers in schools and society. 
So how to create and design a personalized learning space to practice art in this current virtual and digital learning pedagogy era due to the COVID-19 pandemic? Mm. Well, we have a lot of opportunities, I think. Um, for me, I think that, um, and I said this earlier when we were talking about, you know, why I seized this opportunity. I think that sometimes there are moments in life when you realize that it's, um, there's a change. And that, that change I have felt, um, at least during this moment in time, that COVID is, one, is a catalyst to think differently about what the possibilities are for art, education, for culture, for people, for language. Um, th there's been a return for, in people, at least in, in, in my country, uh, and I think in this part of the global south, a return to thinking about community, a return to thinking about family, uh, and, and what's important in that, in that space. Uh, I don't know whether that's the case in the global north. I think it's a little different. But in our part of the world, I think that we have come to also understand our politics slightly differently through COVID. We, we've watched some of the very big issues politically and health-wise in the global north. And so art education then is positioned to rethink what we can do, the role that we play in supporting young people to understand who they are, in um, providing a platform to present who you are, to understand who you are. Art, art is, is made by us. It's our first language that we ever use before we even learn to speak the languages of the countries that we live in, the languages of our culture. And so dancing and drawing and, and um, performing, we, we need to understand as an embodiment. And if we can use those embodied practices um, to empower us as individuals, then, then that's, what our, that's what our job is for. And, and I think that th this is the moment to seize that, to seize that change and to realize that, you know, that instead of arguing over things, which often happens in the art world, we argue over, you know, who gets what and who has more grant money and to, to actually um, create some connections with each other and rethink some opportunities into the future. What, what do we want our future to be? And who are those futures determined by I think it's the artists that we need to ask the questions of we need to be talking to the artists and those artists need to be working in consultation then with others what do the integrations between art and engineering hold what do our um, what, what does what does removing the binary of art being somehow othered or less than or less important how can we actually change that conversation and make sure that art is always central you know, when I go to school, I learn about art and I don't learn about art from other places. I learn about art from where I'm from first. I don't, I don't when I'm living in Melbourne, learn about art from Germany until I've learned about the art of Australia and I've learned about the art of my Indigenous First Nation peoples. And then I start to engage in a broader conversation. They're the changes that I think that we need to see. And that's, that is a pedagogical knowledge change. That means that instead of looking to others, we look to ourselves to understand things and we're in a really great place to do that because the world has shrunk during COVID. You know, we're kind of located in our spaces, we can't travel. And so it's a good time to look inwards and realize what it is that we have in our own space. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so and uh, for next, uh, we have a comment from uh, uh, Dr. Steve, from came from uh, Gijay. Uh, so Gijay uh, mentioned that Seeing the Maori video, it can uh, be guided as that every man should know for of his brother in Sudanese water, uh, water, air, earth, and fire. But his girlfriend already exists because we cannot see students working to produce it. Okay, uh, this uh, only is from uh, Dr. Steve. And I think uh, now we came f uh, to the last uh, questions for uh, this, sec uh, this section. It came from Ibu Asri. Uh, they come from University of Indonesia. I want to ask to all of the honored speakers. I am from public health background. All of the presentation are wonderful. I am wondering how would art and technology would be used to make messages that would make people and children more internalized and comply to the health protocols during this COVID-19 pandemic era. So it's quite difficult but yeah it's real questions because <laughs> yeah uh, we we know we have to teach our children to uh, behave uh, properly during the uh, this uh, pandemic okay so maybe who wants to go first i'll go ahead and go yeah, first on that 
Uh, I already, I sent a link because she typed it in the chat. Um, there's a good article from last year from the Journal of Neuroscience about the storytelling brain. And it doesn't apply just to stories, but to the arts in general, that uh, they're becoming more aware and more able to measure the impact of different art forms. And when there are things that are vivid and dynamic, it engages the attention. I mentioned Stanislas Dahan and what he studied about the consciousness. So getting the attention, first of all, and then putting it in a way that is, well, in the case of COVID, you don't want something that's too frightening and you don't want something that is too light. Uh, so finding that sweet Goldilocks zone in the middle and uh, combining dynamic visuals along with the storytelling is going to trigger several centers in the brain at once. And that's going to make it more effective and make it last longer. And you want both of them. You'd have to find a different form for children and for adults, of course. Okay, thank you. And uh, maybe uh, Dr. Catherine or uh, Dr. Ono would like to answer. Dr. Catherine is on mute again. Mute. Okay. I think I'm on mute. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, I've been involved in the uh, uh, community basically in Indonesia, uh, and also I was uh, I'm still jury on Satu Indonesia Award, and the idea is very simple. We need uh, like uh, Dr. Steve mentioned, it's about storytelling. So what we actually doing actually we need to grab the story from people among us and tell how things during COVID, how to survive during COVID, how to uh, do things during COVID. Okay. In the uh, Satu Indonesia Award, uh, uh, this year, we provide five awards for COVID hero. And their story is amazing. One is uh, what uh, driver, ambulance driver, uh, and she she is the only ambulance driver in Indonesia right now, and she got this kind of award. And her story is very touching. And if you hear her story, uh, then you will understand why you need to follow the uh, the protocol. And the other, the other uh, awardee is the story about how to survive during the COVID, how to do work from home, how to study from home. If you hear their story, there's also amazing. One of the uh, story I received is from Bandung. Uh, the the restaurant called uh, Restu Mandi. Restu Mandi is uh, Padang restaurant. Uh, uh, during during the first month of COVID, they 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 goes to bankrupt, uh, nearly bankrupt basically. They they cannot get money. And how to survive is they move online. And in one month, they make the same money as one year in conventional restaurant. So this kind of uh, in very interesting story. It can be relayed from one person to another person, and in, uh, internet can be used for that. Uh, that's about the story. The other thing we can use is the two-way communication, either to WhatsApp group or any group. Uh, this kind of things can be used to convey the, this kind of story, hoping uh, heard this story people they can then follow the uh, uh, protocol. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> and if you use the internet, that means the kids can actually design the advertisements the kids can the kids can tell the stories the kids can draw the pictures you know i think a participatory arts methodology is really important arts methodologies uh uh you know ensure that our pedagogies make change so a participatory me methodology means that artists artists um, go into schools artists go to communities and if that's via digital then they create the advertisements. What does it look like when a kid makes a great little film about washing my hands and that's the film the community sees? 
that that makes art important but it also says that children's knowledge is really important in understanding um how how i'm going to survive a pandemic rather than somebody that's really distant from me and doesn't mean anything to me uh, and the way that kids speak and tell stories is, is the way that they listen to each other i think uh, th th this is why art is so important participatory methods that we use as collaborators as artists we also use as researchers uh, and so instead of looking outside we just need to look to the way the artists work artists go and they find the right person to to communicate and then that that communication is the message it's really important to do that kind of work ask ask a seven-year-old what it means to survive a pandemic and they'll draw it for you and there's your advertisement already made for you okay thank you thank you for for the interesting answers from the the, the three speakers for this uh, session so uh, I think that's all marked the end of the first session. But before uh, we close the session, I would like to uh, make a resume of uh, the first session of the Artes, uh, uh, the plenary session of Artes uh, 2020. Uh, first is that the pandemic uh, provide, actually provide a new method in art interaction, collaboration, and experience. So we could explore the opportunity and potential of digital uh, platform. They are also open for interaction between digital and also uh, analog activities, such as the activities uh, done by uh, Dr. Catherine. The second one is the diverse media and recipient uh, senses could enrich and, uh, and can be used to, to explore and understanding uh, art forms. And I think the last one is that the, the condition could provide uh, a, challenge, a fresh challenge to, defend, to venture into new territory through our creativity to find new potency and possibility, especially in the fields of arts. Uh, again, thank you for Dr. Catherine, for Dr. Steve, and also Dr. Ono for the interesting uh, presentation uh, today. And we hope that uh, we can explore a new uh, frontier by uh, like learning from these uh, seminars. And again, thank you, and also for the audience, thank you for uh, following us until the end so i will uh, give back the uh, microphone to uh, the mc uh, thank you very much thank you very much mr hafiz aziz ahmad for the wonderful presentation and moderation so actually uh, i believe we can benefit immediately from the discussion because we can see that there are a lot of inspiring stories regarding the art and COVID-19. Okay, so thank you very much. So now we come to the end to the first plenary session. And then the second plenary session will start probably after 60 minute breaks. And all participants and attendees are expected to stay in the room during the break. We will begin the second plenary session at 1.20 p.m. So for your information, there will be three speakers presenting the second plenary session. So the first is Professor Gunnar Spellmeyer from University of Applied Sciences and Arts, Hanover, Germany. Second is Mr. Aaron Sido, PhD, the Chairman of Museum of Modern Contemporary Art in Nusantara, Museum Machan. And then the third, Dr. Ernat Rerum Naturalium, Sparisoma Firidi from Bandung Institute of Technology. So you may also access the abstract book and other materials on a bit.ly slash abstract underscore SA2020. So see you soon in 60 minutes. Thank you very much for the first plenary session. See you. Excellencies, participants, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to continue to our second agenda of the event, the second plenary session of our test 2020. This afternoon, we are indeed honored and privileged to have with us three great speakers who will share with us their views and experiences on art for technology, science, and humanities. I shall introduce them to you all. The first one, Professor Gunnar Spellmeyer from University of Applied Sciences and Arts, Hanover, Germany. Mr. Aaron Sito, PhD, the Chairman of Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Nusantara, Museum Machian. The third, Dr. Ernat Rerum Naturalium Sparisoma Firidi from Bandung Institute of Technology, Indonesia. During the second plenary session, the speakers will be moderated by Mr. Hafiz Aziz Ahmad, PhD. 
Let me give you a brief introduction of our moderator. Mr. Hafiz Aziz Ahmad, PhD, is a lecturer and researcher in Faculty of Arts and Design, Bandung Institute of Technology. His research focuses on visual language, animation, and literacy. He finished his undergraduate study in Bandung Institute of Technology and got the PhD of Philosophy in Chiba University, Japan. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Hafiz Aziz Ahmad, PhD. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you uh, for the opportunity and we meet again for this uh, second uh, session. So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and also uh, distinguished speakers for this uh, second session. And welcome back to this uh, the uh, the second artist to, to 2020 challenges of art in practice and education in virtual space discourse reflection interaction and projection and uh, <clears throat> similar as the first session and for the this second session we also have uh, three uh, presenters from different background and uh, professions so the presenters are professor dr gunnar spellmeyer from university of applied sciences and arts hanover germany uh, Aaron Seto, PhD, from Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Nusantara, or Museum Machan. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Rer Nat Sparison Maviridi from Bandung Institute of Technology, Indonesia. And uh, similar, also similar for the, like the first uh, session. So for those who, uh, audience who have uh, questions for each of the speakers or uh, particular speakers or uh, for the three of them, Please uh, feel free to drop your questions uh, to the chat session on the Zoom meeting uh, platform. Okay, uh, uh, with, without no further delay, so let's begin the second session of our test 2020 with the presentation from Professor uh, Dr. Gunnar uh, Spell Mayer. And for Professor Spell Mayer, the stage is yours. Hello. <clears throat> This is Gunnar Spellmeier talking to you. I'm a professor for industrial design at the University of Applied Sciences and Arts in Hanover. I'm teaching in the bachelor and master courses and I am the initiator and the academic head of Nexter. Nexter is the entrepreneurship center of the university and with this range of responsibilities and activities I am, of course, very interested in the future. So I am delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you at Artish Conference in this very special year. And let me just underline everything I'm saying is a contribution from my Western point of view. And you are asked to switch these insights, my ideas, into your region, your culture, your situations, and your future you are facing. Regarding the title of my speech, Future Skills, Abilities, or Competences, I was wondering, in Germany we are dividing the term of competence in two parts. In Germany, we say it's this part is Fertigkeiten and the other part is Fähigkeiten. I try to translate it, but the mother language English guys I knew they said, oh, you're gonna, uh, we don't have this strict division and uh, we, it depends on the context we are using it. So if I want to talk to you about Fertigkeiten and fake kite and it means i have to make a decision and i will use abilities for fat tick chitin chitin abilities in my german understanding means this is a learned part of behavior it means your ability to write to read to paint it's a task related individual activity it's trained and has automated sequences on the sensomotoric level and the other thing fähigkeiten the skills are psychological processes controlling the execution of activities of abilities these are analyzing and synthesizing processes which are not observable and can only be developed
Additionally, I was wondering how to prepare teachers, students and creatives for the future. And where are the necessities to solve the challenges? And which challenge, right? So we are facing a lot of challenges and stucking in the middle of a pandemic catastrophe. This is happening while we are facing challenges in democratic societies and having the dramatic climate change made by mankind in front of us. The solution will not be only to reduce and to recycle, not only. And waiver or reduction consume isn't attractive. So in my opinion, reuse, reduce and Recycle is necessary, but not the only situation regarding the climate change. The solution, in my opinion, will be technology, the kairos, the fruitful moment, and closeness, standing close together in our societies, being connected as humans. And Andreas Schleicher reports from a meeting of international educators who are in charge. He said, everybody realizes that the skills that are easiest to teach and easiest to test are now also the skills that are easiest to automate, to digitize and outsource. Of ever growing importance, but so much harder to develop are ways of thinking, creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, decision making and learning. Ways of working, including communication, collaboration and tools for working, including information and communication technologies. So, times are changing. What about abilities? What about skills? There are some abilities easy to automate. And regarding the future of work and societies, we have to understand what happens to innovations, what happens outside. And often, new technologies are often overestimated and in the beginning, they are overestimated and underestimated in the long run. And the Gartner Hubs hype cycle is visualizing what happens with an innovation and uh, there is an innovation trigger, there is a peak of expected, of inflated expectations, and there is a kind of valley of disillusionment, disillusionment. And when you understand in this valley, when you are maybe a startup with a new technology, when you understand the obstacles, when you adapt to the situation and learn of your failures, you will go for the plateau of productivity. And this maybe take years or decades and corona seems to me to make this compress it's a very compressed time it is fast and everything and a pretty good visualization about the way of innovation into the markets is the technology adoption life cycle i guess you know it and you know there are innovators and there are early adapters and early majority but between the adapters and the majority, there is a chasm. And Gladwell said, we need the tipping point. We, we, there must be something to make an innovation stepping into the bigger market. Otherwise, it would go down and never come up. And for me, this is the Kairos. The tipping point is for me, the fruitful moment that something will go into the true reality. And when I said Corona is compressing these times, I feel like the early majority is suddenly the unexpected early adapter part. So people suddenly maybe feel like innovators because of Corona. Suddenly they feel they are doing something brand new sitting on a, sitting on a camera in front of the camera talking to colleagues but why haven't they done it years before the technology has been there google hangouts google meets meets skype was it the bad experience we could have saved a lot of travel times using this but we haven't used it now we are using it
now I'm talking on a conference in Indonesia. Of course, it would be pretty good to be there, to be around you, to have a talk to you, a discussion to you later on with a nice cup of tea. And it's even cold in Germany, actually. But <clears throat> what happens with all these jobs and activities? Routine activities with low qualifications are exposed to a high risk of, at automation, of automation. And it will affect people with lower incomes considerably. So we have to take care for them. We have to educate them. We have to empower them to be prepared for the future. They want to have a future. And we have to empower them to avoid that they are having crude, cruel ideas about uh, what actually happens uh, about uh, where is Corona come from. It's made by Bill Gates. Oh, oh, oh. So uh, strange argumentations, strange ideas are already on the market. They wouldn't be on the market, I guess, if you, we could deliver feeling safety, spending trust, maybe to the government, maybe to the decision makers, and trust are your own competences and your own skills. So we should educate them. And we are often, long time before Corona, we were talking about transformation. And I realized people felt insecure about this term transformation. We have to transform from A to B, but what is B like? Uh, I prefer to be in A. Let's stay in A. It's so cozy. It is so convenient. Uh, I know where is everything. I don't know where to go and how to. So most of the people feel unsettled about that. And they feel the change is a have to. They must change. But they don't want to. And where to? We have to accept the transformation is a phase, a period of changing, a time of a space of an in-between. Creative people knows this phase in their creative processes. There's always a time of nothing, of feeling unsettled, of feeling insecure, where to go. We are used to it, but they not, are not used to it. We have to train it. And the challenge is how to change the have to into a want to. Even in times of Corona, when there is an existential crisis, we have turned the fear to change into a lustful change. I know it's pretty hard. There is a professor in the middle of the 50s feeling safe and he is talking about just switch the crisis into a chance. Yeah, but you can believe me, I know phases of feeling insecure. When I set up my own design office, I was struggling a lot. And I am already frightened in these times about all the same things are happening. Where is the future going to? What will happen? Will our democratic societies stand for a good future? or not. What has happened there? I am frightened as well, but what I have is the ability to adapt, to say, okay, that's it with this dangerous situation. Where is the aspect of chance? And then we are good when we are as an educator, we empower the people in the next generation to give back the lust to change and the lust to design the future. And today, innovations are developed by human design, uh, human centered design strategies, such as design thinking, for example. And we are giving back the people the agility and the lust to change to employers in these special programs. The future will offer a democratized manufacturing through 3D printers, for example. Design thinking is giving them also back the power to create something. 
we are facing a batch size one reality. We don't have to invest at first in thousands of produced products. We can start with a one product reality. There is a big chance for us to innovate with a lower risk. We will see embedded meta products with a total package of services and products. The consumer will be a prosumer. The integration of business players from outside the industry and all this puts the consumer at the center. And it means value creation potentials are arises at the boundaries of traditional industry and deadlocked market practices. Imagine what this means. And it means a huge and strong development of the flexibilization of work and life. It will accelerate. And I'm not going to talk about every point listed here on this black chart, but what does it mean? Increased productivity by digitalization. Complex value creation. Creating values in the industry with participants from other branches means you have a net of business partners. And you have to be a good partner. And you have to be in a good relation to create values. And if not, you are not part of this network. And maybe you are not able to create value. And what does it mean as a father in your family, maybe when you have to handle questions by your business partner and the questions by your young daughter? Ich habe leider nichts zu deiner Suche gefunden. Oh, sorry, Siri asked me something. That is one aspect of the flexible work. So volatile demand with a high pressure to adapt, one day delivery, one day production. What does it mean? Less and less people will work in the industry. They will work in the social area, in social professionals, in health systems. Flexible work processes and relationships. I was already talking about this. Employees will have a sorrowing over their working hours, at what time they will work on it, and their working places. Months before, we couldn't imagine that we will stay at home and work in a kind of home office. Suddenly in Germany and now it's nearly allowed for everybody. We will have a continuous reassurance of one's own possibilities and interests. What does it mean for us as an employee in the future? What does it mean for our generations? They need to have a foresightly planned employment biography. The CVs will change, they will have phases in their life when they will be self-employed. They have to take care for the next contract, for the next projects. They have to initiate, initiate something, what the world needs. And all this in a network of partners. What does this mean? And a German foundation called Stifterverband made a study about the future skills. And the, they said, it's like a pyramid. On the top, there are some rare technology specialists. But the basic is digital key qualifications and non-digital key qualifications. If you take a minute and think about digital key qualifications, it is quite easy to list them. You will be right, I promise. But I was more interested in the non-digital key qualifications. And they said, oh, it's five skills are problem solving, creativity, an entrepreneurial mindset and, uh, and self-initiative. It is adaptability and it is persistence. But problem solving, creativity sounds familiar. Aren't we as the creative professionals used to it? Are we are not self-initiating something? 
We are professionals of these skills, obviously. So I was wondering, how could we teach it better than we are maybe already doing it? How could we empower the next generations? And what will be the role of creatives regarding this future skills? And you might maybe uh, be skeptic or critical about these skills. If you have a look to the World Economic Forum, the top 10 skills, you will find these skills already in their top 10 for this year. And compare it to other studies, it is similar. It is similar and I am totally convinced they are right. And I'm convinced because there is a new international standard by the uh, International Standard Organization regarding innovation management. And the innovation management standard is saying in seven dimensions you have to work like a design thinker and work on the topic of lean startup and be agile. So this means for me when I would translate it into skills, these skills are necessary. And it's important to take care for them and to develop them. Since seven years, I am working together with the EC in Jakarta, and I'm very happy about this collaboration because we are able to test and we are not praying from a stage to them. We are in the middle of the students of in a transcultural project with German and Indonesian students. And what we are doing there, I would call it affinity spaces. The term affinity spaces is developed by JPG. He was observing the younger generation and he said how oh, they they learn the lyrics of their favorite songs. They learn the connection between some music stars, but they can't learn maybe the vocabulary of another language. Why? And he is saying we need affinity spaces and these spaces, the people, the students, the pupil are learning in a good way, but these affinity spaces are informal. I suppose we should develop a formal affinity space. We have to jump into the middle of the learning group and be there. And regarding the Viktor Frankl's basic motivation for human beings, Frankl was an Austrian psychologian. Um, he said, people want to feel safe. They want to be in a good relationship. They want to be in a good relation with others and with the world. And they want to feel respected and recognized. And they want to feel fulfilled. In view of the contemporary and future orientation of studies and the development of the above mentioned skills, these basic motivations mean a safe and learning environment full of trust, a devotion of what is valuable to oneself and to others as actors in these team processes, appropriate praise and challenges, clear objectives, a practice-oriented approach and in the learning context an explanation of the learning objectives. This is the character of an affinity space. And the character of an affinity space is a collaboration on a kind of informal level. Yeah, of course, this maybe sounds paradox, but we should go for it. And we should go for a flat hierarchy in learning systems. Sometimes they call it a flat learning it means on an eye to eye level between students and teachers. And this demands by the teacher an inner sovereignty and an attitude, not a status, not a pure status. And it's then we have a participatory culture of innovation, a sustainable learning environment. And the learning opportunities driven are driven by common efforts. And this is then at the end an exploratory experimental approach versus a formal education system. And with this with this affinity spaces, we would go for the future skills. We would take care for them. 
interactivity is, regarding Jenkins, a characteristic of technology, while participation is a characteristic of the future and we have of the culture. And we have to go for this culture with affinity spaces. And an additional role for creative professionals, I see. It's not only the ability to design a product or a brochure, a post or a stage design. It's not only this. There is a new role and I think it's our responsibility as a creative to empower people's future skills. They are not keen to think creative. They are not used to think problem oriented and understand the problem. They are not educated to develop their own self-initiative skills. They are not used to do it. We have to take care for it. We have to empower them. And this is the most time my business actually, when I'm working outside the universities, I empower people. And this picture is showing employees of a big insurance company for an employee in this company. Everything is fine. Everything is solved. Everything is working. But some feel in 10 years the world has changed and the world of insurances has changed and we have to do something. We have to understand the change and we have to have the skill to change and to design the future. So I was working with colleagues on a format to empower them. I love this picture because it's a hybrid event. Some were working in presence, some were working on a camera. They are playing, they have fun and they are serious working on future, on innovation and on their ideas. They are not only having fun, they also cry because sudden sometimes they feel how hard it is to go for an innovation how discuss how to realize the idea was wrong and to start new we we are going with them through these processes and at the end they have the chance to work on their ideas bring it into a reality the company is comparing them and supporting them a great job and the company is getting for this lab we are uh, initiating there they got an inno award the innovation award of the german insurance branch and this gives more energy to go on with this to make more experiences with this and that makes me feel we are right empowering them and setting up affinity spaces so my time is gone um, uh, thank you very much for your patience and uh, Thierry Makassi if you would like to um, add some question uh, questions to go into a discussion with me follow me on social media or write an email I will answer you and uh, thanks again for the opportunity to talk to you. Have a good conference and goodbye. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Gunnar. Uh, so, uh, how are you? Uh, so, is it like still uh, in uh, in the morning in Germany? Yes, it's quite early. The, what the time sports. is it? <laughs> The daughters are already going to school now, and we have had breakfast. <laughs> and it's cold, very cold. <laughs> so it's 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 very happy. Uh, we, we are very happy to have you uh, at this conference. So it's nice to meet you, and also interesting uh, talks uh, about uh, the future. Yeah, because we are we have to see for the future about this uh, condition and how we can overcome. Uh, about this uh, condition. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it was an honor. Thanks. Sir. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so I would like to make a recap for uh, Professor Gunnar's uh, 
presentation. So I think uh, we need the competencies uh, to, to face the 21st century. I think uh, other than technology, we also need the ability to transform and to, uh, to adapt. And, and, and for that, we can also uh, make the, the uh, like the exercise through uh, participatory cultures and also affinity uh, spaces. And I think it's also the duty of uh, the professional creatives uh, to uh, make use of such affinity spaces. And also uh, uh, <clears throat> make the world as creative uh, um, uh, mediators. <clears throat> okay, uh, I think we will continue to the uh, second uh, presenters. Uh, the second uh, session. So we will have uh, Mr. Aaron Seto uh, to uh, to talk about the uh, role of uh, the condition about uh, the museum and also how to uh, have the yeah how how the museum will adapt with the uh, pandemic condition and uh, for the, also for the futures. Okay, for uh, Mr. Aaron Seto, uh, time is yours. Hello there, my name is Aaron Sito. I am the director of Museum Machan in Jakarta. Before we begin, I would like to thank the organizing committee of Artesh 2020 for the invitation to present uh, today. And I hope that this small presentation will help us to open up some important conversations um, and uh, around issues which are facing museums here in Indonesia and also around the world. As we approach the anniversary of the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic, we can better understand how our daily lives have changed and the many challenges we face as we adapt to a new normal lifestyle. In this short period of time, there has been an extraordinary upheaval of the regular processes and practices in museums. Everything from exhibitions, the delivery of art education, even the identification of audiences and constituencies has been disrupted. It is a landscape where physical engagement has been subsumed by ideas and experimentation with the digital. The full impact on museums and institutions is yet to be completely understood. In May 2020, UNESCO published a report called The Impact of Museums Around the World in the Face of COVID-19. Even at this early time in the life of the pandemic, the reality is stark. This report reveals the existential threat for museums around the world, while also revealing some of the immediate challenges that institutions face in the shift towards the digital. How institutions will experiment and adapt will be modulated by a range of socioeconomic factors, such as how, wide, such as how widespread and available technology is, and the literacy and proficiency of the community to harness technologies as they become available. While illustrating the immediate impact on institutions, the discussion also reveals a digital divide or sets of challenges for broad communities to access culture as a, as a result of this drive to the digital. Socioeconomic context frames how potential audiences will enc encounter culture now and in the future. Greater awareness of the socioeconomic inequities and biases which modulate participation is necessary for a number of reasons, not just for the pragmatic planning and development of the future activities of institutions, but it also gives us reason to pause and to think carefully about the function of our institutions in society and the assumptions that one makes about the role of culture and art education into the future. This short presentation is an unfolding case study of Museum Machan's response to COVID-19. It will look at the immediate challenges and present some of the ideas and thinking of the museum's team as it began to shift its programming and art education activities in March 2020 to online platforms. The presentation focuses on our education program. And later on, I will also um, present uh, a little bit more information about one of our imminent projects which is launching, which, in, which encapsulates much of this thinking. The presentation um, um, also uses the framework of the museum and the broad discussion amongst museums around the world, such as this UNESCO report, interchanging the perspectives of exhibition making with the provision of education, educational activity. The global perspective is utilized to give some context for the Indonesian situation, 
highlighting that though there may be similarities of experience, there are distinct challenges for our institutions in Indonesia to surmount. This presentation illustrates many practical concerns, but it also raises questions of whether or not this moment of pause has allowed for a rethinking of the role of artists and the museum to create critical and inclusive spaces. But let's firstly turn to the UNESCO report, which is titled Museums Around the World in the Face of COVID-19. It was um, published in uh, May 2020. And, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, here, here summarized some of the, some of the uh, key global tr trends that as of 2020, there are an estimated 95,000 museums in the world that are not evenly distributed. 65% in North America and Western Europe, 34% in Eastern Europe, Latin America and the Asia Pacific, 12.9% in the Asia Pacific, 0.9% in Africa and 0.5% in the Arab states. Interestingly, this is an increase of about 60% from uh, 2012. Um, as of March uh, 2020, 90% of museums temporarily closed their doors and it's suggested that 10% may never reopen. What the global situation seems to suggest, firstly, is that there has been a greater development of museum and institution building in the last uh, decade since 2012, a 60% increase. And that museums uh, in the face of the COVID um, pandemic very quickly work to suspend their operations and that there are also some very serious existential threats for a significant proportion which were being forecast as early as, uh, uh, as, as uh, very early in the life of the pandemic. This section uh, called Facing the Global Challenge of Access to Culture really raises uh, a lot of the, um, uh, the important challenges, I think, in terms of accessibility. It reveals that, um, that the digital divide is now more evident than ever. For millions of people around the world, especially in developing countries, access to culture through digital means remains out of reach, making it difficult to launch virtual museums or access online collections. Almost half of the world's population does not have access to the internet. There is also an important gender gap 327 million fewer women than men have a smartphone and can access mobile internet. The impact of the crisis on cultural institutions, especially museums, requires a global approach that reaffirms the central role of culture as a means of making societies re resilient, that helps reactivate the economy and the cultural ecosystem in order to promote a better future. These two paragraphs are direct quotes from that report. The last paragraph I think is instructive as it recognizes the economic role that museums played and will play in the reactivation phases for many societies and economies. And that there is an intertwined link between access to culture and the promotion of a better future. The first paragraph highlights the intersection of culture and technology and challenges for our institutions to deliver program programs which are broadly accessible across our society. Now let's uh, turn to the Indonesian uh, context. I'd like to uh, thank the museum's education team and also the communications team who have pulled together uh, the, these statistics. Uh, you can see where the sources are. Um, and I think that they, it provides an, um, a, a really fascinating comparison uh, and um, reveals some of the, the really important issues which face our, our colleagues, our, edu our educators here in Indonesia. So in terms of internet users, uh, Indonesia has between 80 to 100 million internet users. Um, uh, the majority of them are 15 to 40 years old. 10% uh, are less than 15 years, years of old, but 21% are greater than 40 years old. Um, I think that the, the second column, which talks about the access, school access to the internet is really uh, very, very inter interesting. Um, 
it indicates that across the country, 13,000 school students and teachers don't have access at all uh, with uh, a range of different reasons why um, different places don't um, uh, struggle with internet access. And then the third column talks about um, challenges for students during PSBB. So only 68% of students have had access to the internet. 32% uh, 30, don't have uh, access at all. Um, it's been a struggle for students to keep track of time and schedules. The, the lack of face-to-face -face, uh, means that there have been real difficulties in understanding subjects um, and, and, and the study. Um, and I think also the lack of social interaction with other students has been a very important factor. I suppose those of us who have children or who are, um, are close to children, will, will school-aged children, will uh, probably have experiences of these um, these these particular these particular issues. What these statistics highlight is the real challenges facing educators in the context of online learning environments, the structural problems which, with access, and we can extrapolate some of the socio-economic factors which drive the capacity of students to engage and to learn. In the context of the previous set of uh, global data for art museums, um, and placing this information side by side, we can begin to better understand the complexity facing cultural institutions, many of whom are also faced with questions of their own survival. As I mentioned previously, it raises two important interrelated questions for now and also for the future. A pragmatic one, how, to shift, how do we shift our programming towards online environments? How do we deliver things online? And secondly, in such an environment, how does an institution better reflect the society in which it operates? So now I'd like to turn to, um, to Museum Machan and to outline some of the steps and the experiences which we have, which we have had within the last nine months. So we uh, made a decision very early on to temporarily close the museum. Uh, we closed the museum on the 14th of March. And at that time, it was a very difficult decision to make because we had just opened two major exhibitions. The first being an exhibition of uh, Malati Suryadamo, a survey of uh, performance work. Um, a, a very, I think, a very, very important survey of a very important artist. And the second was a, a really large video installation of the German artist Julian Roosevelt and his um, film installation Manifesto. We closed our doors 11 days after these two complex exhibitions opened to the public. And so um, it wasn't an easy decision to make, but it was a necessary decision to make. And it came with a whole range of different um, um, emotional responses within, within the museum. On, on one hand, we were really aware of the, the fact that artists work so hard to um, make and present exhibitions. And um, at that point, we didn't know how long the pandemic would last or how it would unfold, but we decided that it was necessary to make an early decision. So here we have an install um, installation shot of uh, Julian Roosevelt's manifesto. It's one of the most complicated uh, video installations that I think is being presented in Indonesia. And it is um, unfortunate that we, when we are able to reopen, we will not be able to reopen with this, um, with this work. And then the second was a series was a major um, survey of Malati Suryadamo's um, performance work. So I want to talk about some of the key principles which really guided, or have guided, and continue to guide our approach to programming in this um, in in at this moment. And like, like many museums around the world, we very quickly began discussions about how we should respond to the pandemic. Um, we assembled an internal team to review uh, many of the issues and to begin planning. You have to keep in mind that our discussions at this point were not just about programs, but also generally about how we would, uh, how we open, should we open? What are the, what are the risks of opening um, opening to the to the public but we were guided by by some of these by, by some of these um uh these these issues so firstly is is really around um accessibility um 
you know, how we understood as we were looking at our, as we were conducting lots of our meetings um, via video conferencing, that we understood that not everyone had the same data capacity as, as others, um, that there are, are real challenges, I think, with internet in Indonesia. And so if we were uh, being challenged by it, it was also going to be a challenge for our uh, audiences. Uh, we also knew that that um, not every household was what is 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 equipped to uh, cr to print and to um, download uh, materials which we might need might want to develop. So we had to uh, secondly also review the existing programs. As the situation unfolded, uh, we also made the decision not to produce any new programs in the first stage uh, until we were able to review our broader institutional response. Um, there, were a lot, there was a lot of uncertainty around programs, around the health situation in the city, and, and also how our staff would adapt to working remotely. How do we organize? Uh, how do we meet? How do we make decisions? All of these things which you take for granted in an office had to all of a sudden be rethought. It means that there had been a transition, also a transition in human resources. And in the early stages of the, of the, um, uh, of the pandemic, we prioritized, uh, we, we did try and prioritize the, uh, this human aspect. Issues around accessibility. Well, um, well, what we first did was to review things that we had already digitized, um, not creating new new things, but to to uh, organize and index the, the the materials that we already had, and to to locate them all into one accessible format. We created um, a page or a section on our website where um, people could engage with our collection database. Uh, they could access collection. They could access collection audio guides. Uh, they could access our podcasts. Uh, we create. Um, we have a program called Much on A to Z, which is short discussions on art topics, and these are all um, uh, recorded and delivered as podcasts. People could access workshops and video tutorials, and they could also download activity sheets for kids, which we redesigned from lots of the other, the, lots of the previous material that the education team had already created. Uh, and one of those really important uh, components was our education resource kits for art teachers. So we were, so we were quite clear about who our our audience was for these. It really was for the parents at home and the, uh, with uh, school-aged children, as well as the, the teachers who may have been, the art teachers who, who may have been looking for readily available um, uh, materials that had already been digitized that they, that they, could, uh, that they could utilize. Um, one of the first issues that we, we um, um, tackled was really a design issue. Uh, we reviewed out. We did review the, the the materials and removed lots of the design complexity out of the um, documents. We understood that there was uh, data capacity uh, issues in in uh, within within our audience, and so we also tried to make sure that if we if we did have a uh, something that was downloadable, it needed to be as light and easy as possible to download. We made the decision not to create new programs for a little while until we were able to index what we had already done. And this was a um, uh, internal resourcing um, approach because because we had since 2017 we had already created lots of lots of material, and it just required um, a, a little bit of organisation on our behalf to um, to to make these things accessible. Social media is also really important, I think, to the life of the museum. Um, early in the life in our life, since at least um, the uh, since at least 2017, we have embraced social media to help us carry the message of the museum. This is partly a response to the the appetite and um, um, uh, of of the of our Indonesian audiences, but it also does relate back to issues of accessibility. Uh, social media is inexpensive; it's widely accessible, 
It can help us to cut across social and economic class and it engages with significant audience sizes. Um, and as such, it can be a valuable platform to assist with art education. The foundational me mission of the museum is around, edu is around education and understanding that, that um, art education in Indonesia is, um, is sometimes lacking. Being able to embrace existing platforms like this is, is very important. I believe that we, we really have had a successful, um, um, we, we've, we've been able to illustrate some really great successes. Uh, the silver lining of this is, of course, is that probably we've been able to to reach out to more people than what we would normally be able to do in if we were open to the public. Um, and probably we were reaching out to people who would never normally come inside into a museum. So I think that think that um, this is probably a silver lining for us to be to be thinking about. So here are some some basic statistics. Um, we've had over 110,000 web page views of our educational material. Uh, in terms of our, our social media statistics online um, for education, it's, we've had over two and a half million uh, impressions. A much on A to Z program, which I spoke a little bit about, which is our, our podcast program, uh, which we work, which we present on Spotify and also as a download on on the on our web page, has been accessed more than six and a half thousand times. So if you can consider that normally in an event like this, we might have. 30, 50, maximum 100 people, for us to uh, engage with over 6,500 people is really quite extraordinary. Um, and going back to the, to, to the social media aspect, um, we decided to create some collection guides and uh, instead of delivering them as videos, which would, which would be heavy probably for people to download, we decided to create them as a kind of audio guide which was delivered on Instagram. Our most accessed document is the audio guide for Aramayani's painting Lingayoni. It's one of probably the museum's uh, very important works of this of, of this period and of this artist. And it's been accessed more than thirty-seven thousand times on IGTV. So, I I, I really I mean one of the things that we we've um, thought very deeply about, and we probably don't have, this is, this is more of a challenge for us as we work towards the future. This is definitely not, um, I don't think that we have yet reached the conclusion of, of this issue, but I think this statement really encapsulates some of the thinking in the museum right now. So that the challenge for us, uh, also being a young institution, what we only opened in November 2017, is that we want to create an institution that is responsive, not only to the technological developments as they became available, but which are also reflective of the communities of artists and also of the audiences which surrounds us. So what this means, I think, is that we really, that as much as this pandemic period has been difficult, there needs to be an idealism in our approach. Uh, and how we embrace new formats and processes. Uh, ultimately, we want to elevate access. We don't want we we and 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 to um, access broad have broad social engagement with art and culture, and the uh, digital context, the online context, is uh, one of the tools which we hope to to um, to do in the future. So I, I wanted to introduce you to one of the upcoming projects which we are about to launch. It opens in December 2020. It is our UOB Museum Much on Children's Art Space Commission. It's the latest commission in this series supported by UOB with the artist, uh, the Balinese artist Chitra Sasmita. So this project began its life as a project that was going to be presented as an ex exhibition and um, uh, inside the museum where, where kids would be guided and would be able to engage with and touch and to uh, work together to, um, to participate in the artist's work. We understood as soon as the pandemic hit that we had to completely rethink how to do this. So we worked with our partners we worked with the artists to think about a new approach that 
encapsulates what we internally call a hybrid approach. It involves physical, it involves a physical presentation because we do hope that at some stage people will be able to come and see these, these magnificent, this magnificent painting. But it also encapsulates virtual, a virtual experience, uh, including uh, web AR, augmented reality, as well as other digital and online engagement processes. We've been working very um, uh, carefully with the artist to uh, produce, produce them, um, bringing on board some technology partners to, uh, to achieve this. And I'll talk a little bit more about partnership uh, in passing right at the end. But let me just firstly play a um, video of the, of, uh, about this project. Museum Macan buat satu ruang seni anak yang menghadirkan pengalaman di luar jaringan dan juga secara daring. Nah, tentu saja ini merupakan sesuatu yang sangat kita banggakan, namun juga kami memiliki sesuatu yang baru yang kami tawarkan, yaitu untuk pertama kalinya juga Museum Macan menawarkan ruang seni anak yang terinspirasi dari kisah Nusantara yang berasal dari tradisi Indonesia. Hal yang menarik lainnya adalah karena instalasi ini diciptakan pada masa pandemi, maka komunikasi dilakukan secara daring. Bahkan proses instalasinya sendiri, teman-teman yang sedang menginstal di lapangan di Museum Macan, di, kemudian Mbak Citra ada di seberang sana di Bali menggunakan laptop, melihat dari video conference, dan juga konfirmasi dilakukan dengan cara merekam video, merekam suara, dan ini menurut saya sangat menarik. Jadi kisah antar berantah ini cukup berbeda dari karya-karya sebelumnya karena sebelumnya karya-karya saya banyak e, mengeluarkan statement-statement mengenai isu-isu perempuan. Tapi dalam kisah antar berantah ini e, saya banyak e, menyesuaikan pemikiran saya sebagaimana saya mempunyai seorang anak dan memikirkan bagaimana dunia mereka kemudian kebebasan mereka dalam berpikir dan berimajinasi. Jadi saya mencari kisah-kisah dan e, mengoleksi narasi-narasi yang sesuai dengan imajinasi dan pengembangan e, alam berpikir anak-anak gitu. Maka saya di sini mengangkat e, kisah tantri. Nah, kisah tantri yang e, umum kita kenal di Bali sebagai kisah-kisah fabel yang mengangkat nilai-nilai kebaikan, kemudian kebijaksanaan, kepemimpinan yang digambarkan e, melalui tokoh-tokoh atau hewan gitu. di sini sangat sesuai saya rasa dengan e, daya imajinasi anak-anak. E, gitu. Kami sangat bangga dengan Citra Sasmita yang terus mengembangkan karir di kancah seni semenjak beliau meraih gold winner di Yobi Painting of the Year 2017. Nama beliau kini menjadi referensi kesuksesan seniman seniman akademi Yobi Painting of the Year. Tentu saja hal ini sesuai dengan misi kami, yaitu memotivasi para seniman di Indonesia untuk terus berkarya demi kemajuan seni dan budaya bangsa. Sehingga kekayaan seni Indonesia tidak hanya diakui di negeri sendiri, namun juga hingga tingkat Jadi semoga dengan adanya aktivasi virtual, pameran ini yang tadinya hanya bisa dinikmati ketika datang ke Macan, bisa juga dinikmati oleh teman-teman yang ada di kota-kota uh, lain dan bahkan di negara lain. Sampai jumpa di kisah antah berantah. So 
in conclusion, I think that, I mean, uh, well, firstly, I don't think that there really is any conclusion at this point, because um, even though that this is a, a live kind of case study, uh, the, the real, the real um, I think there are two takeaways for me. One is something very pragmatic. And then the other one is really uh, much more aspirational about the role of, uh, of art, of artists, of institutions, as we think about how we engage broadly with our, with audiences for the betterment, for the, for the future of, of um, our, our societies. But let me just uh, touch on the, some of the learnings that we found in the practical components that um, as we were developing these projects, resourcing and planning became really important. We were, um, uh, it, it was sometimes quite straightforward, but then sometimes it was also quite difficult to to make that shift. Our timelines needed to be uh, to be rethought. We had to think about what what kind of uh, resources and, and um, uh, the resources that we had in order to 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 make new projects, which is one of the reasons why we decided not in the early stages of the pandemic not to create new new projects. We also had to think about the capacity of our audiences, and this was this is reflected in that UNESCO report, and it's also reflected in the statistics of of the of um, of the Indone Indonesian education context. Not everyone has the same capacity, and where possible, we need our design approach needs needs to meet these capacity issues. Um, we also believe that we should harness existing platforms. Um, whether or not that's social media, whether or not that's Instagram, where, where we, where we deli deliver lots of our information um, on our existing website or even uh, looking at, at uh, places like Spotify where we, where we um, place all of our uh, podcasts. Uh, social media is, uh, again, I think that there is, this is also the silver lining of social media that, that it is, it, it does help us to create accessibility. It's inexpensive. Um, I wouldn't go so far as democratic, but it does open up a uh, much more, it does open up a space for conversation. Partnerships, partnerships are going to be really important for the museum uh, now and also into the future. Uh, firstly, our Technology partners have a better handle on the technology than what we do. And at the same time, they're also very excited about the opportunity of working with artists and also working with museums and getting the idea of art and art education as broadly and, and as accessible as possible. And then the last bit, which is really um, uh, the ongoing process component, and that is that um, Chitra says meter, which 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 launches very shortly, is the first ex first of our experiments. It won't be the last of our ex of our experiments. We will still um, we we will monitor and 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 get feedback to see how it can be better developed. And um, you know, this is a, a really exciting uh, situation that we find ourselves where we are um, where the museum's programming is actually being responsive much much more responsive than it would normally be if it was simply a um uh a physical environment but what i'm really proud about with this this project is not just the fact that the partners have all come on board and the artists has come on board to, to really test the ideas but that we're also talking about um other other uh, issues which would not normally be considered within within the museum. So these issues around around uh, public space and the intersection of technology. And I'm going to uh, leave you again with I, I really like this composite slide that it it illustrates how probably how we will view uh, art in the immediate future. We don't know what the future future will look like, but the immediate future I think there will be lots of assisted. Um, uh, engagement through technology, but let's return back to this aspiration that we, our institutions need to be responsive, that we need to be reflective of, of the communities of artists and the audiences which surround us, and that we have to come back to what our mission is. Our mission is to elevate access and broad social engagement with art and culture, and in, and for those reasons, we have to be mindful of lots of the biases and challenges which are inherent within the uh, technology space. Thank you. 
thank you very much for uh, Mr. Aaron Seto for the presentation. I think it's very interesting to learn how adaptive we could be uh, during the pandemic uh, to <clears throat> to find solutions from what we are uh, facing uh, uh, right right now. So, uh, hello, Mr. Aaron, how are you? <laughs> Well, thank you. Great it's to nice. be here. I think uh, we, uh, we, I, I'm looking forward for the uh, uh, question and answer uh, session because I think more, more people wants to know about the, what what Muslim uh, what Muslim can do uh, during this uh, pandemic. I think it's also interesting to learn from, from that. Okay, I think um, before we uh, go to the question and uh, Q, Q, QA uh, session, then we will have our uh, third uh, presenter for today. So I would like to present you uh, Mr. Uh, Firidi Sparisoma, who will uh, give the uh, presentation uh, live. Before uh, Mr. Firidi Sparisoma, uh, the time is yours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hafiz. So uh, can I share the screen? Can you see the slide? Yeah, we can see the slide. Thank you very much. So, uh, lad uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to present our work. So, actually, it's not yet a work, this is still a proposed idea. So, this is a collaboration of me, uh, uh, Dr. Rahima, and Dr. Damayanti. We are from different departments, actually. So, we try to communicate what we have in order to produce something new. This is the outline of this presentation. So uh, I would like to also introduce the authors in order to make clear what our uh, role is. So this is me, uh, Spiritum of Firidi. I'm actually a granular physicist. I'm from the physics department, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, ITD. And the second is Dr. Sofia Rahima. She is a food technologist from uh, Agricultural Industrial Technology Faculty, UNPA. And then the last is Dr. Nuning Yamayanti from Faculty of Fine Art and Design, ATP, which is actually the visual artist. So uh, why we are choosing the rice, you can ask uh, Dr. Rahima, and what is the artistic part of our idea, you can ask uh, Dr. Nuning Yamayanti, which is where is the physical properties of our system is uh, my part. So uh, we will uh, uh, discuss a little bit about granular materials. So every day we are dealing with granular materials. So for example, we have uh, salt, rice, coffee, medicine, uh, cereal, uh, sand, uh, soil, and then uh, grain. Uh, one of the granular materials that is interested Interesting is a uh, repose angle. As you can see that fine sand, quartz, and the angular pebble have different repose angle, and then dry and moist sand also have a different repose angle. Where this repose angle is responsible for the landslide and also uh, snow slide. So in some condition, they uh, can hold such a repose angle, and then the slide is uh, happen. Then the other phenomenon of uh, granular material is the floating and colliding uh, uh, spherical uh, particles. For example, in the Lake Michigan, uh, there is a uh, uh, basketball size ice, which is uh, 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 contracted during the winter. And then the, in the Los Angeles Reservoir, they are putting a plastic ball in order to reduce the evaporation. So the dynamic of this granular material is also interesting to discuss. And then there is also uh, plasmic patterns, which is uh, uh, observed by the German musician while he are uh, introducing vibration to the uh, uh, iron plate. And then uh, with different frequencies, we will have uh, different patterns. So, and then uh, in, in, in Indonesia, especially, and also in the Asia, in the ancient uh, time, we are want to purify our rice. We do the winnowing process by using, uh, I don't know what it is, it is a uh, tatampa. Then 
uh, order tray, we try to shake it, and then at the end we will have uh, only the uh, price without the mask. Then there is also other phenomena about uh, materials, which I will not explain it because it is too many and not so related to uh, what the uh, work that we are doing uh, right now. And then uh, one of the aspects that we want to introduce to our work is the edible art. So there is a term above edible art. So I just uh, used the uh, definition from Andre Jewiski 2018. So he said that there is a new and emerging form of art, which is edible art. So and then he claimed that if food can be assumed as art, then certain form of gastronomy can also regard it as high art, where the revolutionary cooking is one of such examples. So actually, before I searching uh, seriously about this, uh, my opinion about the edible art is not so deep like this. So one of the interesting uh, revolutionary cooking is uh, jokes, uh, practical jokes made by Albert and Ferran Adrias. It is Kafia's uh, Ferrico di Mello. So he tried to make the uh, fish roll or the kafia, but using a melon and a gel. So at the end, you can see that you can uh, uh, produce such uh, entity, uh, hydrogel actually, like a uh, fish uh, roll. So, and then the test is similar. So, and then in order to stress the uh, jokes, they are also serving that with the, the same can that used to uh, where people buy the caviar. And then the next is uh, one of the aspects of granular materials that I'm interested, that we are interested in, is the dynamic. So normally when we are talking about the art, the some of the things are static, but when it is become a dynamic, uh, is it still an art? This is actually a question. For example, we we know that about the kinetic sculpture that was uh, exhibited in the BWM uh, museum here. So this uh, steel ball or the plastic ball can up and down and then uh, make a, a surface that. Uh, was designed by the programmer using a computer. Then there is also a musical instrument which is still using a marble. So the marbles is uh, put up by a rail and then at the top of the instrument it will falling down and then hit a plate with different size which produce different tone. So the things that I showing, I'm showing here is related to the particle or the spherical particle, which is part of the granular uh, materials. And then actually there is an ancient toy or the instrument that can perform the dynamic of the granular materials and also can perform, uh, can produce sound. Perhaps you know already know about the uh, Newton's cradle. So it is already dynamic and it is uh, producing sound. And then we came to the uh, main materials that we are proposing, which is rice. And there is some art related to rice as I uh, searching in the internet. So uh, the first is when people try to use a single grain of rice as a media to write something, for example, uh, in the China, they use it uh, to write so many characters only in a grain of rice using a tool and then they are must performing the work uh, using the microscope. And there is also a work that is rice as a two-dimensional picture. So they arrange the art, uh, arrange the rice and then they make a photo of it and then they check the position of the rice and then keep the process uh, repeatedly. And then at the end, they will have such a movie uh, using 
model animation using the rise x pixel. And then uh, there is also a three dimensional uh, structure using rice. So actually, this is an uh, ancient uh, culture uh, in China. This is uh, uh, was disappeared, and then one of the people there try to uh, uh, make it live again. So this is the example. For example, they are using uh, uh, the, this rice for constructs. Uh, crabs or the animal people or the other things. Then uh, today, uh, due to the pandemic, people become more active uh, using the social media. One of the favorite social media is TikTok. And then one of the challenge that uh, the people have is to use rice uh, for uh, performing some or the making some figure. This is uh, one of the simple things that only showing a letter. Uh, I've also uh, observed that they are coloring also the one, the rice, and then they make some funny figure like SpongeBob or the uh, or, or the uh, other uh, Marvel figures. So they are uh, using this rice as a pixel in order to uh, creating some figure, and then they using graffiti and then the tray to make it fly and then they are uh, filming it and then, then they are publishing in, in, in the internet. And then when we are moving a little bit outside the rice, uh, we have the peri as the plantation in the Japan, in the Aomori. Uh, the people try to plant, they have planned the different variety of rice of paddy and then they are let it grow. So since we are already calculated the position of the paddy plant and then as it emerged in the uh, spring, the formation of the paddy with different color will give a, a, a macro uh, painting that people need to uh, stay far from the uh, side in order to see the whole uh, picture. And then actually, I don't know how to put this, but I need to put this. So there is also puff rice also or the, we, all, we know actually the, the partner of this is a popcorn. So uh, you are really familiar with the popcorn, but we can also use rice to make a, something like a pop rice. So this is a puff rice. And then uh, X related to the, our current situation. I want to uh, review about the current technologies that we can use to transfer the sense from our to the other through the uh, internet. So uh, there is what I have invented by uh, MIT, which is a tangible media. So this is uh, one cup of media that for example, uh, we can record a gesture or the, have a gesture of the user and then using a, a device like a Kinect and then the gesture of the user will translate to the other place through the internet, for example, and then the other place, the gesture can be activated using a Kinect of a, a plastic that can up and down and then can perform the, uh, the motion of this uh, red ball here. And then uh, you already know about the 3D printing. This is uh, a very useful uh, technology right now. And then I also read that people also invented a 3D printing for food. So uh, now the, uh, some accessories of the food or the, for the birthday cake is made easily today with the 3D printing. Then what's also interesting is uh, the company uh, Gatorade is creating a water droplet 3D pixel. So actually, when you see this up, uh, apparatus, this is actually a place, uh, a shrink here in that uh, let a drop, let a water droplet down, and then by using a lot of hearing and the control using a microcomputer. They can decide which 
droplet should be let it down and which droplet should be uh, which ring should be off and which ring should be uh, on and then by calculating also the gravitational acceleration they can assure that at some times the pixel should be in some place there and then they use the flashlight or the to assure that the pixel is reflected to light and then they can have a three-dimensional figure so if you see this uh, in the video you can see that we will have a real a three-dimensional uh, figure or the structure which can be seen from different uh, angle so this this could be the answer when for example we want to interact physically where the three the, the two the two pseudo uh, the pseudo three-dimensional using uh, our monitor is not uh, sufficient and uh, what's amazing is uh, a singapore student uh, uh, have invented a virtual cocktail so there is a device they can introduce some of the chemical different chemical which can tune the taste of this cocktail so as the illustration you can uh, set for example the smell of orange ginger and black pepper and you can change the concentration of these three tastes in order to produce some kind of uh, uh, drink and then when you have this information you can pass the information to your friend to the internet as long as your friend have the same device on the left then uh, since the invention of the drone people already use, use the drone for many things one of the amazing use of the drone is to make a three-dimensional a huge gigantic three-dimensional figure in the sky so this is one of the example a figure of three-dimensional dragon using uh, about i don't think about a hundred uh, drone and then uh, we came to the uh, the part that we are proposing our idea actually i don't know how to uh, name this part so i just use uh, three question mark here so we are already uh, materials which is we we choose rice here and then one aspect of the rice is edible so when it is edible it should be biodegradable uh, and it's global and it's economical so it means that when we can propose this, we have a media of the art, which is uh, uh, environmentally friendly. And then for the part of the artistic, actually it's not my expertise here, but I just propose the rice as a media because it is the granular materials. And what I find interesting is the dynamics. The dynamic in this case, can be inter interpreted as moving when an object or the, a media is moving it can be done or when it is transforming for example in the case of popcorn or the puff rice it transformed from one of the solid one into the uh, larger but the porous one it is also uh, i call it a dynamic so why dynamic is important i think when we can see something dynamic it will give immersive experience. So we will experience it more than we are just seeing as a, a static uh, thing. Then the first idea is that uh, underline that I only uh, see it as a physical aspect. So why when we are uh, combining uh, cutting grains of our rice at work, while we are vibrating it so uh, we have our clad me patterns previously since we know when we crafting a single grain or the we use a rice at work we can change the center of mass of this uh, single grain and then it will behave differently while it is vibrating on the uh, plate and then when we hit the plate actually we try to make it a puff rice so when it is do the puff the puffing process it will also change and i don't know what will happen so can we have a different formation or can we have different structure i don't know but with this kind of work physically we have uh, two dynamic things one is moving of the grain due to the vibration 
and the second is transforming due to the heat. So it will change uh, chemically from the solid rice single uh, single grain to the puff state. Then uh, perhaps we can also modify the taste to pass the message, for example. And then after all, we can also still eat the work after we can we do the performance. And then uh, I would like also uh, talk about a pandemic situation where we are not allowed to interact closely. And then we believe because I also uh, give him a lecture, uh, there is some sense that cannot transmit it through internet. So I cannot explain that uh, very detail because I'm actually not a uh, art people, but as I lecturing something like a physics or the programming, there is some sense, some feeling that can not be transmitted through the uh, video conference, through Zoom or through Google Meet. Right now, we can already transmit text, sound, picture, animation, two dimension and pseudo two dimension. But how about texture, for example, when we want to say that it, this is soft or this is hard, what about the taste? The smell, the smell, how about the temperature? We want to say that this is warm and this is cooler than that. What about the pressure, for example? And then what about the immersive experience? For example, if you entering an old building, it is different than when you're entering some uh, forest, for example. So how we can uh, introduce this feeling, what we are experiencing right now to the uh, our audience? So one thing is perhaps uh, this is only an idea that the artists who make a work, I believe that the work will emit some senses and experiences that what the artists want to share to the audience. And then one of the sense should be measured and saved as a digital data. If it is can be uh, Trans, uh, transform to the digital data, and then this digital data can be transmitted through the internet. And then this data, which is received in the user side, must be used to recreate the sense, which is, should be the same as the artist wants to. And then the sen this sense will be uh, received, uh, will be uh, filled by the user of the audience. It should be using um, some other machine. Perhaps it can substitute what we call it is an aura of a work of, of, or of a class that can support our delivery process, for example, in giving a lecture. So the summary of this uh, presentation is some rice related arts have been shown, and then an idea related to the rice has been performed. And then recent technology might help to bridge the distance, especially in teaching. So, we need to transmit more sensitive than what we are already know in order to feel that we are connected to others. And then the presentation can be accessed through this link. And thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Viridi, for the presentation. So for the first session, we have uh, insight from uh, engineers now we have also insight from a scientist so it is also uh, for me it's always uh, interesting to to have like a two dif uh, like perspective from uh, different uh, uh, area again thank you for uh, um, Viridi for the uh, presentation uh, i think now we move to the uh, Q qa session and I think we will. I believe that there are quite many questions awaiting. So maybe uh, we should uh, start. <clears throat> okay. First, uh, we have a question from Arina Arina Fril from Sriwijaya University. Uh, the question is for uh, Professor uh, Gunnar. So uh, the question is: Designers sh should create products which not only focus on designs but also to develop products and services which will please and serve people and uh, society. My question is how we put human-centered design 
in new technologies and uh, innovative products which are rapidly arising? Um, yes, thanks for the question. Um, I recommend to uh, focus on the user and to understand him and his needs. So um, understanding the world, the human, the user, the consumer is, in my opinion, the most uh, important way to a successful product or to a successful service. So where are the needs, the truly needs? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, for, <clears throat> so if uh, you need for the question, then don't, don't hesitate to, to ask uh, more uh, deeper questions about that. Uh, so for the second question, I, I believe it's for all the speakers. It came from Fajar Henraman. Uh, so he asked, I have a question for all speakers. What, what would be our future competences, digital mindset related to the industry 4.0 during and after the pandemic? What initiatives should be prepared and initiative of, for our futures of works? So I think this is like maybe like a reflective questions about what we should do to the future uh, regarding our competence and also uh, a digital uh, mindset. Okay, who would like to answer first? <laughs> maybe I gave five minutes to... <laughs> Is a good no, not yet. Could, uh, um, maybe because I started with the future skills, I could uh, uh, try an answer to give an answer. Uh, so I already were talking about the future skills. But in Germany, when my generation or maybe a younger generation is talking about the generations coming to into our universities we are a kind of arrogant, I would say. And we have to understand this generation Y and the generation Z. And they are already on the market in the social media and they are blogging and producing culture and media. And they are always living in a kind of bitter atmosphere. They they write, they, they are doing pictures, they are producing films, they are earning likes and comments, and they, they learn what, what does it mean to uh, talk about intellectual rights regarding producing culture. They are in the middle of a kind of participatory culture. And that's why I guess we should change our uh, way of educating. It's not praying from the from a stage. It is more jump into a middle of a group and try to collect knowledges and yeah, make world better. Okay, thank you. Maybe now from Mr. Uh, Aaron Seto or maybe from Pak Firidi. Which 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 will uh, be first? Thank you. I mean, let. let let me let me try and respond to the to the question just from the a very pragmatic experience of the of the museum. I think that uh, skills are changing, and also uh, all the, the and the activities of, of museums are changing. But I think that we also need to be really mindful that there is always going to be the need for both traditional skills and also uh, future forward skills. And I think that the the challenge is not so much about what the, those skills look like but really about how much we, we can use um, uh, technologies or skills to actually create more critical engagement. It's not necessarily about production. It's not necessarily about creating more stuff, um, but it's also about how do we, how, how, how do we, how do we use, how do we use environments to, to reflect and to, um, and to contribute in different ways to, to our, our cultural lives. And I think that that is, regardless of, of, of uh, what kinds of um, work environments we are, what, what sectors we are in, that, that level of critical engagement is still going to be very Okay, thank you. And uh, from Mr. Fididi? Uh, from my opinion, is because right now we are 
forced to stay at home, for example. I'm just seeing that what normally I miss about my uh, neighbor, for example, my neighborhood, my environment. So when there is a problem, actually, I have no solution because normally as a lecturer, for example, we think nationally, we think globally, we think about the something uh, new uh, incoming, a new trend or a new future or a technology, but actually the problem in front of our eyes in our next door, we, we don't know the solution. So I think the future when the pandemic, for example, still happen, then we are uh, trapped in our place. We should adapt to solve our uh, nearest uh, problem actually, which is we are not ready for that. I don't know. Actually, I'm still disruptive. <laughs> still not. Thank you. Okay, I think for the next uh, questions is uh, for uh, uh, Mr. Aaron. So uh, there's a question about is the online uh, visitor can see all the Museum Machan's collection? <clears throat> and is there any like a free online student? Uh, is there any like free online courses or uh, is there a free online student to know more about? Actually, I, I okay. also. Um, <laughs> Okay, let the, the first question about the collection. Um, no, not everything is, is online. Um, it's a very slow process, in fact. Uh, as, much, as, as quick as the, the technology demands us to be, there is still a human um, intellectual component that has to, has to also meet uh, the technology. And, and often the, the writing about the collection takes a long time. It does, it just takes a long time. There are also lots of really, um, practical issues about putting uh, collections online and that's got to do with copyright and I think that that's one of the 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 that's one of the other challenges I think about um, um, uh, about the, the the online environment is that we also have to be aware of our rights and obligations to to artists and that um, seeking copyright often costs money and it definitely uh, takes time. Um, we're in the with the uh, the second component um, about online programs. We, we have a number of programs which we are about to launch. One is um, we've shifted our educators forum. So we run a, a a forum for teachers and educators that coincides with every exhibition, and um, we're about to. Uh, if you if you follow us on online, you'll be able to get some more information about some of those um, some of those some of those events. We haven't done a lot of workshops, and um, yeah, but you know there, there, there may be some in the future. But but at the at this point, we haven't done uh, lot, lots of workshops, as as the question has asked. Okay, thank you. And uh, the next one, I think, is only comment for uh, Dr. Firidi. So, and also for uh, I think this is a. Uh, for, there's a uh, statement from uh, Mrs. Ms. Uh, Tati Surati yeah, that she just said that I plan to sign for an, a design interior for sketch of houses as neat as wants the woman to stay at home, nice, cozy, and healthy. So maybe she reflects that maybe you should uh, uh, stay at, at home. And the other one is uh, for Dr. Firidi. Uh, for your explanation, which opened my perspective that we do, we do not know what exactly the rice is. Rice art show us how the technology help us to appreciate any small thing. So it is also uh, like uh, appreciation for uh, report by uh, Mr. Uh, Firidi. And I think uh, maybe I have my, my own question uh, too for the, all of the speakers. So during this this pandemic, uh, like 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 uh, what Aaron uh, did with the uh, Museum Machan, so actually how 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 long it it take uh, like the, all the three of you to 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 adapt? I mean like the conditions came quite suddenly, and we have to make a like a very quick decision how to do and how to make activities regarding our institution. So uh, I mean. Uh, could you please uh, like uh, tell us how is your first response when when we heard about the pandemic and how the next step uh, will be to yeah to uh, to face this uh, uh, situation? 
it's, it's a really it's a really important question uh, about how to uh, about managing in a in in in, in these types of crises it, it's a it not um and i suppose so one of the first things that we did was to actually slow down because that the 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 kind of um we 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 needed to be really certain about our about the approach and to make sure that that was a correct approach for the time. And also because there was so much uncertainty that was flowing around us that, that uh, the, we needed to also, um, we needed to make sure that we could trust the information that was coming to us. And if you can't trust the information that's coming to you, well, you need to, to manage your teams and your programs in, in a much, much more conservative, uh, conservative way. But I think um, for us, I think the primary, mode was about understanding that there was a human and emotional reaction that people were having i mean we you, you can you can talk about how to how to uh change your program or how to how to reorganize the 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 physical engagement with the museum but the fact that that you know i had all of my staff who were facing the uncertainties of the pandemic, not just in a professional sense, but also in a personal sense, made us um, or made me think that actually we needed to be much more responsive to those needs. And um, uh, you know, some people would not everyone is happy about about not having the physical uh, relationships with people. It was a, it was it's a very very confusing time. So I think that the the but the but the answer to the first part of your question is that I think that we have to constantly evolve. That there's not a that there is not a single uh, textbook response that we can apply to the to the situation um, because simply because each of I mean looking across the three of the speakers all of our our expertise comes from very 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 different places and so that how how we engage with um, how we adapt is going to also is based on so many other factors as well. Okay, thank you, Aaron, and maybe for. Is Firidi or Professor Gunnar? Yes, I think it's uh, interesting to have a look to the human psychology. So when the uh, pandemic situation is coming up and starting maybe in Germany, uh, the normal and first reaction is to feel anxious, to be frightened, um, to understand what, happen what happens there. So when I was thinking about a pandemic situation, I thought it's a kind of apocalyptic zombie uh, atmosphere. Uh, and now I just get a course of stati statistics and uh, wearing masks and how is it working with the hygiene aspects. Nowhere there are no zombies uh, on the streets actually. But it is a catastrophe and a lot of tragic is happening already. So we are frightened and we are anxious, but uh, some people have to lose maybe a lot, some not. And um, it depends. For myself, I ask immediately, what could I do? What is my power? What is my ability to do? And how could I adapt? But I am used to do it because as a creative guy or as a designer, I'm always dropped into situations with a problem and I have to solve it. But I can understand other guys who are not able to do it, who are stucking in the feeling of being frightened. And that's why I'm saying we have to educate and to train people to think creative and to be creative it's the only way to handle weird and strange situations. And to my colleagues and uh, to the work uh, of Aaron Sito, I think the museum's work is very important to make this creative education for everybody in our society. That is a very big contribution. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Gunnar. So, can we have... Uh... And so for uh, Mr. Firidi? Actually, uh, until now, I'm still struggling in trying to understand the students, actually. 
normally when we are in the normal class, we can see when we have a poker face, for example, when we have a blank face, we know that the student do not understand what we are explaining. But right now with the uh, online lecture, we do not know about that. We do not know what actually the student do while we are uh, giving the lecture. So, and then the response is also different. So, uh, but the test is getting better. I don't know because they can access the online resources or other thing. Actually, I'm still trying to figuring out whether we are giving a, a right a de a lecture delivering way or actually we are put the student to the wrong way. I don't know. Actually, I don't know. We are still dealing and as you know that uh, I was assigned to take care of the first year student in ITB then this is actually our uh, uh, task together to assure that our student can adapt for the next year actually. I think this is uh, Mr. Hafiz. Okay. I still have a lot of questions about that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, answer. I think we uh, or, uh, we have one question again uh, and uh, one more questions or oh, two two questions. One is for Professor Gunnar. Uh, so, how can you change your mindset when there is a change due to COVID, especially how to tech uh, technology virtually and uh, what is being done and what is challenge or opportunity uh, for this, uh, yeah, this kinds of situation? For me, I think it's quite easy and I'm wondering why, uh, why is the society not acting and handling the situation or doing something new? because I am trained in think creative and um, to change the mindset is make the people able to uh, understand and to, to act. And creativity is a part of intelligence. And I think we train our pupil in schools to, to read, to write, but we don't develop their skills regarding creativity or problem solving or persistence or adaptability. We, we, we are producing a kind of yeah, machines maybe, uh, good in uh, calculating, but not in developing their own skills to adapt, for example. Okay, and working on the mindset, so so in Germany with the industrialization and the Taylorism, um, people are trained in being busy, working, working, and working. They are forget to live. And regarding this, if I have a question, they will immediately answer. They are not thinking about the answer at first. They answer, and we have to step one step back, go one step back and think about the answer and find an own answer and not a common answer. Okay, thank you, Professor Gunnar. And I think last question is for Aaron. There is some, uh, there is uh, one of the audience uh, want, would like to know how you do the, uh, the, the curation in the deciding of the value of the works in this fertile uh, condition like getting the value and make some it's a really good question yeah I, I, it's a really good question because i think that that um um in fact our approach to research has completely shifted in the last um uh nine nine months um that there is i mean if firstly our, our collection and our projects are uh both um uh, you know, it's about Indonesia and it's also about, about art from outside of Indonesia. So it's this kind of international mix. But since the pandemic has shifted, lots of the, the curators have really been tasked with uh, actually interrogating how we work. What will exhibitions look like in the future? How will they go about doing um, international research in a situation where we, where, where we may not be able to travel or we may not be able to invite artists or we may not be able to... Um, bring the artwork into, in, into the country. What is the what is the um, 
the mix with technology how are artists going how are artists rethinking how we see see what's going on around it so i think that i think that it's a really interesting moment moment for us uh we won't know exactly what how it will manifest probably for, until the next couple of years but it is definitely an active conversation which we're which we're having i don't think that we can we can work in the same way that we were working uh 12 months ago I think uh, it's either adapt, uh, and there's there's a real excitement in that adaptation. I think that there's there's uh, lots about the the world which we which are completely confusing and which we don't un, don't know about right now. So I think that that's a, a good space for artists to help us uh, relearn about the world. Okay, thank you. So I think that the last questions ended our uh, session uh, for the second session. So uh, please applause for the three wonderful speakers for to, for the second session to Professor Gunnar, to Prof, uh, to Mr. Aaron, and also uh, Mr. Firidi. So I think to close this uh, session, I would like to make uh, a closing remarks uh, based on the uh, presentation and also the discussion that we just already had. Uh, first is that. Uh, we should be open for change, transformation, and adaptation to face an uncertain future. However, the condition also opens for elevation that if we dig deeper, then we could find creative ways to overcome it and seeing the positive side of it. The second is digital technology and communication opens new areas to explore and to innovate and finding new ways to face this difficult uh, condition. And the third one is we also should be always open for new perspective and collaboration and to pre because this could prepare ourselves for the futures i think that uh, close our uh, session uh, our second session for the second artist 2020 so i will give back to the uh, mc uh, thank you and uh, have a good uh, discussion after this thank you very much mr hafiz aziz ahmad for the wonderful moderation so now we come to the end of the second plenary session but ladies and gentlemen before i end this plenary session i would like to inform you all that tomorrow there will be a parallel session starting from 8 30 a.m the committee will give you further information for the schedule on your parallel session via email or you may check for other materials on bit.ly slash abstract underscore sa 2020 me. So ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of all Committee of Artists 2020, I would like to thank all the speakers and participants for taking part and taking the time to join us today. So thank you very much. See you again tomorrow. And healthy. Bye-bye.